The dragons, dragons on the wall. We did it again. Congrats to all my nuggers that's been, you know, surfing away, man, uh, contributing with investigation, with recon. Welcome to the 100th installment of the Preston John investigation. <laughs> we did it again. We cracking the code, we breaking a spell, we keeping our code. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. The beauty about this investigation is that it is the highest level of academia. You know what I'm saying? Um, this manuscript is in Yale University, the Authorian, Joffrey Monmouth, Preston John investigation, all this King David flow. Uh, who are the Indians indigenous to America? These are the highest levels of investigations in academia. All oh, praise Hawaii for popping us off for all the, over six years on this conquest, <laughs> you know, to uh, master ourselves, to see clearly, to get to know ourselves, to remember again. We are the Magi. They've been writing about us for a long time <laughs> in their fables of old. Oh, wow. Hey, I got to thank Hawa. We've been through so much together. You know, every way that they tried to detour us and distract us, we kept focus, and this is how we got here. If we would have got off track and got off focus, and <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we stayed focused, man. That's how we got to press the 100. They can duplicate it. They can reflect it. They can make phantoms and duplications, but the water is the water, man. We got that water. You know, all this is ours. This is encrypted. They can't crack the code. They call it an Indian Georgian Hebraic language encrypted. MIT can't crack it. Yale University can't crack it. It's a book of herbs like Noah had a book of herbs too. <laughs> So we got a lot of meditating to do on the Voynich manuscript. We got a lot of work to put in. <laughs> a lot of, wow, I'm a, I'm a belly flop right into the comments. Oh man. Oh, oh hold up. Okay. Okay. Landscape okay. Home, I like forest. I like this. <laughs> I like this, man. I like how y'all belly flop into Antarctica for us, man. Because we talking Antarctica, man. But first, we talking your comments, man. <laughs> but yeah, Antarctica is a preserved, pristine rainforest. They say the water to my nagas making Preston John. You know, just feels so good, man. And, we're not in it for everybody to be digging on it. If everybody's digging on it at the same time you digging on it, it ain't much of a dig. You know, if everybody got the same idea or 
invention you got when you and got when you got it it ain't much of an invention it ain't much of a thought but we over here we've been doing it for years and it keeps increasing at a beautiful pace and at a pace that's not too much and not too little and all praise a while for that and we here man and <laughs> press the one huddle and we're gonna take it real slow but press the one huddle We got to bring it back to the lost tribes and promised lands. But for that, man, I just want to just take my time and just see what you're saying, man. Just kind of belly flop into a few of these Prestichons and, uh, you know, get the comments directly from the Prestichons and see what you're saying, man. Maybe we're going to start at 99. Let's go. Hey, out the hunter for con. <laughs> health, wealth, prosperity, man, what it do. But most important, health. Look, man. Come here. Come here, Cyrex. I'm going to need you to exit out the back door, man. We don't need all this extra uh, malarkey around here, man. <laughs> yeah, we know most important health, but look how you spell it. B-U-T-T. -T. Come on, man. <laughs> now, real talk, they got all these algorithms and they send all these robots our way, you know, to distract us in the simplest ways. And we're really keen on seeing a hijack and sensing the hijack frequency when it walked through the door. So we, you know, we don't deal with no hijack. We don't care about a billion comments. I care about 20 to 30 real Naga comments so that we can really build the investigation with. I don't want a hundred bull, bull crap comments, man. I want a few of the real ones over here, man. That's what we built throughout the years. A lot. Why? We're talking press to 99. Ahab Hunter for Khan, Ahab Spotlight Films, history, his story, mystery, my story, just hit and play. <laughs> Appreciate all the hard work, Ahab. Matt Gomez exited 20. Oh, he's dropping that drop. Psalms 89, that's where we got on our 89 flow from. Jeremiah 30, verse 9. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 28. Hosea 3 and 5. All cold press the flow. Matt Gomez got the drop. Carla Randall, let's go. There was a book in my house when I was a little girl in the basement that looked like the book didn't never know what it was. Grandparents died. Don't know where the book is now, but the book belonged to my grandfather, man. Hey, shout out to Grandpa, man. And um, yeah, did he have a copy of the Preston Flow? She said it looked like it. Carla Randolph is a wave surfer. what it do, man. Nine Eye Sage, man. Reminds me of the Five Eye Mom, man. <laughs> and it's time to prepare the warships. This is metamorphosis. Nine Eyes popping off. He's out of here. He's in his his warship, man. He, he's out of here, man. Ahab Nine Eye. Uh, Leonel, uh, excuse me. <laughs> Leonia. 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 There we go. Leonia. Leonia, she said. What are you talking about, John? Leonia Abbey, from whence come down, from going to and fro, walking up and down, migrating around and around. Say something like a cube. Man, Leona Abbey got the drive. She's another bona fide way surfer, balcony surfer, man. It was uh, their adversary walking around a cube? That's a great question. Man, you know, we're just surfing a wave. Hey, Ahab Leona Abbott. All right, all right. You know, Golden Mean, John of Patmos, and the Telectonin, Telectonin, T E L E K T O N O N prophecy. We got to dig on that. John of Patros. Sound like Preston John and me. John of Patmos, sound like Preston John and me. Okay, okay, Golden Mean. Uh, David E. David Ben Yahuda, Shalom Family Tribe Up, Stay on Cold. B1 from the city of Frederick Douglass. Okay, okay, David, okay. So Bioni, so Bioni, so Bone. All right, man, you, you, you know who you are. Anaga wrote the memo. She's talking about that Voidin. Anaga got the memo. Anaga is aware. And it's KTC all over the earth playing a lot. Why? That's 
more important than anything, what Naga's got from this Preston John investigation is to be cold keepers or else you don't got nothing else. And once you got that, you got that mem sauce. You, you MHOE, most high over everything. You KTC, you keeping the cold. You got that mem sauce. Now you got that founder youth, you know what I'm saying? Now you got that Dawi flow. Yeah, MHOE, man. Allah, wow. Let's go. Shall I want to the tribe, tribe paradise. So be only. I hope I'm saying that right, man. <laughs> hey, how about Kwa? James Grant, remember this heaven and the hell. One for those who obey and the other for those who disobey. Blessings for doing one and curses for the other. God good versus devil evil. Okay, here we go. So one's damnation or salvation depends upon one's character before you can do good or evil. There must be a certain mind set first. So if vibrating from your lower self energy causes one to experience hell or the lower nature, then something has to has to take place. Oh man. All right, all right. I mean, the bro's clearly popping off about upper and lower vibrations, man, and what all these numbers mean. And, all right. He's in revelations. He's going cray cray. You can't put new wine into old wine skins or it'll break. This age is ushering in new vibrational energy, a change for the better, but there has to be separation between the wheat and the tares. Judgment will be done by the one creative destructive power. You're your own savior and your own captor. Hey, I dig on that, man. Let's go. <laughs> Zayang, Shalawan, my Nagala, get it. Call, which means all praise, allow, wa. Well, he says, yeah, wah, wah, you know me. But uh, when you drop that yeah, you just got your breath and your security. You dig? Let's go. I'm not black. I'm not black. Round and round to 100. Hey, 100. We're taking it real slow from Preston 100. Chief stand still, Ben Israel. No wonder why back in the day they called old buddy Tasmanian the devil. Yeah, man, we're talking dragons. Shout out to the chief. Yeah, man. Okay, Michael Amos, 6,000 years is all the most high will allow men to go back in history. Anything beyond is a lie. But we don't know. We don't know. We're just surfing away. Drop, drop on top of drop. A how to our lady, Dracons, Chef Canyon type battle. Yeah, man, because, I mean, shout out to the con, uh, you know, Chavez El Bay, but. A lot of this dropping links and, and sources, you know, came right from the aquas, came right from the tribe and the ox. You got to give recognition for that. You know, you can't just act like you're having some original thought that's disrespectful and love to the Templar. It seems like they don't want us to be remembered in this investigation. It seems like they want to get the drop on us, but it don't work like that. <laughs> hey, uh, Chef Kani, type battle, who originally presented that Press to John Legend and its sources flow. You know what I'm saying? Can't nobody just act like they just popped off with all this drop. Wait, we're talking about recon. Hijack City gonna wish they told the truth about something as simple as the sources they stole them from. They must be thoughtless. <laughs> She's in that mama flow, that wisdom flow. Proverbs 8. Ain't no coming back from that one. No play play. Aqua surfing the way. Shout out Sob Yoni. <laughs> Sabrina Garcia, big facts allow why it's Sarang. Let's go. Wicked News 81, honey. He's talking about some definitions. Exclude someone from a society or group, ostracize or ostracize. God, God. Group of people who have been ridiculed, ostracized, or persecuted for centuries. Ostracized, like. Tarazanta. Oh man, Leona already know, man. <laughs> we popping off. Charles Johnson popping off. Peace Indigenous and Moral Cons. Regulator 9. Leo Boomington in the room. Hey, I can dig it. Kind Sean got a whole lot of AI. Let's go. Lawrence Richardson, AI 99. Hey, pop off, man. 
I'm just digging on your comments, man. Pressing 98, you know what I'm saying? Hey, we never late. You belly flopping, you belly flopping. Aqua, country, western. I be, yeah, what it do? I totally agree with Aqua Chef Condi. A press to a day keeps the hijack away. Yeah, I think we need that on a shirt, man. What it do? Allow a congrats. Con drop on your exquisite work. Hey, how hey, about on this P on this PJ series? You rock, you roll with the drops, no matter what the subject you lecture on. I'm so baru to be drop nation and to be in the class. I know Hawa don't make no mistakes. I hunted on the way. And man, it's all happening. Maximum respect and hey, AI to a super con M H O E K T C A Halawa. Hey, the water, the aqua, be yeah, and um, hey, hop to the aqua, you know what I'm saying? Aqua, you know, make sure no matter what I was going through, no matter the ups, no matter the downs, I was always held up, not held down. She held, she holds me up, you know what I'm saying? So, I got a special Malaka, I got a special queen, hey, hop to Chef Condi. UCCH, ook, <laughs> damn drop. About 10 presses ago, you strong on the noble title. That boy just drew Ali now talking about body bag, more like extermination on the bucket head. <laughs> right. Hey, look, man, we, we ain't trying to poke fun at nobody. You know what I'm saying? We just seeing clearly, and if we break the spell, we break the spell. You know what I'm saying? 98, right on time with some stuff I've been digging on as far as the car and key language and the car and quito. Of South America, we got to catch up. I'm certainly an elder in need of meat instead of milk. I say that to say that you're a real minister to a naga like myself, hey, noble con dry water. Hey, just call me dry, man. I appreciate you. And, um, you know, this is more validation that, that we are, you know, breaking through the spell barrier, man. Hey, OX, OGXR 626. We got on this, man. Algiers is also home to the large U.S. Marine Corps. So this great Algiers we were talking about that's over there that we see is over here. Now it's home to the largest U.S. Marine Corps Division 4th, which is maybe where the dog lover reference comes from. Devil dogs. Whoa. The Navy and Marine Corps uses generic jargon and jargon specific to the jobs we perform. One example, greetings and accomplishments are often met with who, who ya or hoorah, uh-huh, as a response. Additionally, just across the Mississippi River from Algiers Point is Congo Square and Treme, Trim, with Jackson Square and St. Louis Cathedral in between the two areas, the Mardi Gras Indians still practice indigenous ceremonies. Yeah, but they also practicing a lot of thoughtism, you know, a lot of fallen angel worship in their Mardi Gras as well. But AI Manaka, O G X R, for bringing that out, cheer drop out. Yeah, Wicked News 8900, <laughs> 8100. Khan, I was born in Smithers, British Columbia, Quivera, one of the most pristine environments on earth, spear fishing at the waterfall is still happening. Glad to be part of the investigation. And hey, we're talking Annie, yeah, a hive, 8100, Richard Smith, man. Hey, drive FYI, I'm from New Orleans area, specifically a place called St. Rose, and we have a park inside of the community that always been called Morocco. <laughs> Anybody else familiar with Morocco Park? <laughs> In New Orleans, man. And just a few more, man, before we continue to pop off. Fred Edison, man, love to the bro. Shout out to Nappy. Nappy, go far. Hello, why? They got the Nagaville flag popping off, keeping it cold. Drop. Not only will this be the most epic investigation on YouTube ever, it also it's also an epic accomplishment for you personally to have this kind of fire to bring that water with such intensity and clarity back to back to back to back. This got to be a wreck. <laughs> M-H-O-E. Halawa. 
Hey, you know what, Fred? We impressed the 100. <laughs> you know, we got them uh, guitars playing, and I appreciate that. And this is a accomplishment for all of us. You know, I can't just say personal, although I do feel it personally. I can't separate that from you. You know what I'm saying? You've been here the whole time and popping off. So the water to you, allow wow. Yeah, man. You know, this is, this is, you know, these are the regular flows. You know what I'm saying? These are the, the repeat contributors. You know, give it that energy, man. Spotlight Films, C4, TMH, the most high. You know what I'm saying? Sounds like Florida Seminoles learning the U.S. Army into the Everglades and picking them off one by one in the Seminole Wars. Can't sleep on the Grand Con, son. We are the art of war. We are the art of war. Allow wow. I think it was a lot more built up over here than when they arrived. Shout out to Spotlight Films. Much older than they say when you look at old photos before the fires of the early 1900s. It looks a lot more like grand, a lot more grand, like 1800 Chicago, right? Back to that mud flood flow, you know what I'm saying? My father's daughter, I'm actually from Algiers, El uh, Louisiana, born and raised. Algiers is not only near the mouth of Mississippi. It is on the water. I think we read in Wikipedia where it said it's like it's by itself, you know what I'm saying? Like it's sitting secluded it's still considered the oldest neighborhoods and all that right so it is on the water as we say down here it is on the river the algiers ferry right this is where they used to you know gather the slaves from africa and then ferry them over to new orleans right so the algiers ferry runs from algiers to the east bank of new orleans some of the oldest homes there we could walk the levees and look down into hundred year old homes. It is a highly spiritual place. It is so interesting to hear that the average person hasn't heard about Algiers. Why would we, right? <laughs> Unless you got a basketball team or a baseball team or a football team that's winning championships. Why would they publicize a place so highly spiritual? Hey, hi, my father's daughter. Back to OGXR. This is a master class, my brother. Thanks for the shout out. So much to digest and so much more I can add. Much respect, man. We look forward to it because this is how we got this far. My Naga's adding that drop to the pot. Indo, Indico King, 1111, Corpus Christi School here in Ohio. Also a lot of sacred and historical land here. Along with the mounds, Ahab Indigo, B O W, what it do? B O W White Hawaii Drop Nation is putting the puzzle together piece by piece. Cairo, Illinois is an amazing area. And in the 1900s, they found artifacts in a cave. I believe it was Henry VIII artifacts along with the Egyptian artifacts. I would love for Drop Nation to dig on it. Hey, Cairo, Illinois, okay. 1900s artifacts in Cairo, Illinois. I would love for Drop Nation to dig on and love to the tribe. Hey, B-O-W, what it do? Hunter for Can, Hunter for Chan, what it do? Knowing that there's so many translations out there, I believe that Leviathan was the group of individuals. So we talked about that Psalm 74 flaw. We won't know the meaning behind the words they use, but we know they like using words as a point of reference operation high jump just one example a hop hunter for chan templar what it do man he said that's daniel talking that Balthazar flow this is getting too crazy even for me <laughs> excuse me as i take a short leave <laughs> hey templar take as long as you need man you're a big integral part and in sparking off the creativity uh you know to connect the flow to connect, you know, the dots, you know what I'm saying, to draw the picture out. You know, make sure y'all in the classroom of Templar and read for real, for real, and you're going to get real in-depth flow when it comes to the Presto investigation from the top, man. So, A-Hop to the bro. 
and you know Ahab, you know specifically, you know what I'm saying to, you know every Akanakwa man for real for real, you know what I'm saying that has been longing, you know what I'm saying to connect KTC man, you know with the code to the Creator, um, you know in this investigation now it's like Templar, Aqua type battle, you know I barely got my voice man we. We've been popping off so many presses, but Aqua, you know, let's get Ak Templar. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like I said, Ak Aqua type battle, you know what I mean? Chef Condi and Miss D and a cop of color. I can go, man, you know what I'm saying? On and on into the flow. But you know what it is, man. Ak Templar, LaDawn Rivers, they came from Texas to Louisiana to Oklahoma, had a farm in Oklahoma, and they turned it into a highway. We have a car in our family. Oh, we're talking to car. Let's go. Leona says, my genealogy got to be rewritten from Cherokee to Tennessee. Back to the car. From the Tunisia Sea. Hello, wow, for the breakthrough. We tenacious. Car and car. Wow. Kick Kiamata. Stephen Harris said hello. Wash shalom. Shalom to my all my noggins getting that drop. Congratulations on PJ98. All gas. No breaks. Man, this is Preston One Hano. This is how it feels, man. So I was like a surf the wave in the comments, man. Steady water. Because my tribe is steady water. You know what I'm saying? You, you see very similar wave surfers because we ain't on no play play. In Wisconsin, there's a lot of mounds, historical sites. There's also Cedar Springs. One other interesting fact, when driving, sometimes you see these rock walls like they were a part of a huge building or structure. Then I pass a road, maybe a city named Jericho by one of the mounds. I could be uh, reaching, but... <laughs> Wisconsin, we know, is connected with the Aslan flow. Bear Taylor said, I own a digital streaming radio station and would love to stream or create a podcast with the research. Well, you know, they 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 make <laughs> they're making books out of the recon now, man. And as long as you give it up to the Ox and Aquas, I'm cool with it, man. For our audience and broadcast weekly, excellent work, brother. The truth will set you free. Ten spheres of existence, infinite north, infinite south. We're talking about worlds beyond the poles, infinite east, infinite west, infinite height, infinite depth. Got me thinking about the ice wall. Is the firmer man. 500 years from the first and second heaven. Thanks for the continuing drop, brother. Prayer to you and your family are doing good. Allah, you see how it's all connecting. These videos are keeping my week lifted. Leona, let, let go. Jay, everything said real talk reminds me of the book Vibes at Cosmos. Shout out to Vibes at Cosmos. We dug on that in the flat drop. One on one, man. <laughs> in that book, it shows how the moon is a reflection of what we see on Earth. And they show how there are way more continents. And you were so right about Australia. Yeah, you know, uh, this press the flow also combines the flat drop one on one, the indigenous truth, the frequency four three two, the nine flow, the code. It all comes. So everything we dig on from the flat drop to the indigenous truth to the frequency the four three two, all that flow. Yeah, you know I mean, uh, especially the code, because everything we doing gotta be connected to the code and Exodus 20 got us in code. So the Preston investigation brings it all together. And that's by design of Hawa, not my own. So we say, Allah Hawa, Ahab J everything and Ahab chief stand still with it do. Amazing drop fam, most high Baruch you, your household and the whole 432 drop nation. That's what I love the most is that my Nagas come over here and they see that we are a tribe tribe. They're not just shouting one person out. They're giving it up to the entire nation, 432, the drop nation. 
If the term Solomon, Solomon is a title, is it possible that the son of David that Bathsheba bore name was actually Jedediah or is it the name, that name being equivalent to Nathan the prophet? My bro chief is digging on it into 2 Samuel 12, 24 and 25. And David comforted, comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in to her and lay with her. And she bare a son and she called his name Solomon. The Most High loved him. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet. And he called his name Jed Jedediah, like, uh, I don't know, Jedi. Got him, boss. AI chief. Stand still, Ben Israel, Ben Israel. Because of the most high, man. I think we seen clearly, man. Most enlightening Naga Recon in my lifetime. I'm 33, bro. You gave me so much perspective that allowed me to elevate and transition my paradigm. I'm going, I'm still going back in your archives, bro. All water. I appreciate you taking time to do Hawa Will. Hey, how to bro. Mitch. FRM 611. This is what we mean, my naga, by surfing the wave in real time. So let's go. Press the 100. Lost tribes and promised lands. And we've been digging on the Catalan map, Catalan map. And we got to get the one that has the one that they talked about with the king. There's only one king standing. You know, this, this king is sitting. So. He might not be who they're referring to as this, this kind of cons. We got to find the king that's standing on the Catalan map. If you got the Catalan map and you can find the king that's standing, man, I might have some special uh, MHOE gear for you, man. So hit me on the email, music at 432thedrop.com. Let's go. I mean, they got the Mansa Musa flow, but remember they talked about the one king that's standing? Yeah, because then they start going into the Antichrist, right? <laughs> For one thing, the iconography is, as elsewhere on the map, rather free of explicitly Christian symbols. So they're breaking down the brainwash of Christianity and Christian symbolism. Whereas Antichrist in Christianity would be some devil horn, you know, hellish situation. This Antichrist on the Catalan map <laughs> is much, much, much different. And just real quick, let's get it again, you know. Repetition breaks the spell, and we got to break the spell by keeping it cold. Antichrist, right? Anti their Christ, anti their anointed. They come to you with Jesus, you are anti that. They come to you with Muhammad, you are anti that. We rock with the one shepherd, Khan David. You ain't with it, get out the way because none of your prophets going to lead us to the water. None of your prophets got the founder youth. None of your nuggets is the alchemical dragon. Free of explicitly Christian symbols for another, there's an odd serenity about it all with nothing of the terror, the terror, the fright, the fear, normally to be found in Christian vi visions of the apocalypse. So you don't see all this devil fear stuff on the Catalan map, digging on the Antichrist. <laughs> the depiction of Antichrist is especially startling in what is largely, largest, the largest and most elaborate scene on the map. So the largest scene on the map shows a peaceful king, a benevolent, monarch in a three-pointed crown the only king by the way who is standing on the whole map if you can find that on the catalan map holla at your guala don't holla at koalas and keep that nine on you andre iguodala <laughs> 
Let's go, man. The only king, by the way, who is standing on the whole map, holding out two branches of a golden fruit towards his followers, nobles, clergy, peasants, and all that, man. So who are gathered around him in various postures of obeisance. Everybody is bowing down to the Khan of Khans. Exodus, or excuse me, uh, Ezekiel 37, right? One shepherd shall be Khan forever. They're showing clarity of the order of the creator. They are surrounded by trees. This is supposed to be the Antichrist. Surrounded by trees, flowers. He's holding out golden fruit. He's the only king standing on the whole map. So what we have determined, digging on the, the jaw Muslim flow or the Antichrist Christian flow, is that both the Antichrist and the Dajjal, so-called infidel, so-called kafir, kafir, infidel, unbeliever, antichrist, Christianity, it's all the same thing. That the Christian antichrist and the Muslim antichrist are the same anti your anointed. And the anti your anointed is King David. And he's coming with his dragons. You're talking about him having the kafir written in between his eyes. The kafir is the kofir. Well, let's get it, man. First, we're talking tranquility. We're talking odd serenity. What's so oddly serene is that your antichrist ain't doing nothing crazy. He's over there with golden fruit and branches and, you know, all his nagas already know the order. They're gathered around him. They are surrounded by trees and flowers and more golden fruit, all suggesting a domain of abundance and tranquility. How can this man be anything but a savior or a messiah? But they ain't talking JC. <laughs> there is nothing of the traditional imagery of Jesus about him. So the Christians are confused. How can the Antichrist be like a savior on this depiction, peaceful and serene and tranquil, but he ain't got nothing to do with JC. On the contrary, the inscription below the scene reads Antichrist. Now watch how they connect it back with the New Testament, though. <laughs> he will be reared in Galilee, in Corazon, Galilee. And when he is 30 years old, he will begin to preach in Jerusalem. So it's like they're letting you know the Antichrist ain't got nothing to do with Christianity or Jesus. He's anti their anointing. He's anti the hijack. If you're anti hijack, you're anti their anointing, which means you're anti Christ. Got it. But specifically, what they are, you know, what I'm saying inscribing is that whoever's anti their power. <laughs> will be reared in Galilee, 30 years old when he starts preaching. So they start to name attributes of the Jesus character. Almost like the original Joshua ain't really got none of these attributes. But the one being depicted in the New Testament ain't the OG Joshua. So this Jesus coming out of nowhere from Galilee, begins to preach at 30. He skips 18 years. He goes from 12 to 30. You don't know nothing about these missing 18 years. You don't know what this guy was up to in his teenage years, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. You don't know about his 21, 22, 23. You don't know if he got married at 24. You don't know if he had a daughter at 25, 26. You pick up the story at 30. The New Testament skips from 12 to 30, my nine. Uh, God. So there's the anti they're anointed, and then there's a depiction of really the Christian power <laughs> in the New Test coming out of Galilee. I mean, he's coming out of Nazareth, then through Galilee, and then he starts his whole ministry at 30, and on the contrary to all, in contrary to all truth, he will say he is Jesus, 
Christ, though. You know, David ain't calling himself this. So that made us start thinking about the question. Although the true anti their power is King David. Is this particular depiction of the real anti-Christ or anti the true anointed is the anti the true anointed JC. <laughs> right? Because it's oddly serene on the Catalan map with this benevolent king, the only king standing, two branches and he got this fruits and flowers and trees and it's all happening in abundance and tranquility. How can this man be anything but the Mashiach? But we're just talking about, you know, one shepherd whom I will raise up, Jeremiah 30, Hosea 3, searching for Hawa and Kandawi. But there is nothing of Jesus about him, right? David got nothing to do with this JC. However, <laughs> the true anti, the real anointed, anti-David, the anti-David comes out of Galilee. <laughs> the anti-David starts his ministry at 30 years old, man. And he's the one that comes out talking about he's J.C., son of the living God. And it is said that he will rebuild the temple. So all this New Testament flow is the anti-David or anti the real anointed. The anti the fake anointed is King David and the entire tribe of Israel. Because we're anti all hijack, anti Zeus, anti Thoth, anti all that, man. Come. Come. The 10 lost tribes were not forgotten, however, startling almost immediately after their disappearance with Isaiah and Jeremiah and reaching apoc apocalyptic heights in Ezekiel and the apocryphal Edris, a tradition developed that the recovery of the lost tribes would be a general redemption, a general or a central component of the messianic age. In the Middle Ages, this became part of Christian tradition as well with respect to the second coming. So you see how they start hijacking all our flow. They hijacking the entire Con David Preston flow. We're in Lost Tribes and Promised Lands by Ronald Sanders. We had to come back home where we first started. Because, again, Presto 100 is Presto 1. You did. But we're not at the same place. We spiraled up. So we 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 came back to where we started, but we spiraled up. Right? So I'm flowing, you know. I'm not going to go real long. We, we're going we to we're gonna make an acknowledgement of a checkpoint. We're going to keep going. But we're only going to keep going on our website at 432thedrop.com. <laughs> so we'll, you know, drop drops to let you know where we at, but the full drop, if you want the full press this from here on out, you got to go to our website at 432thedrop.com. And that's period. Because they duplicate our flow. They're replicating, causing, um, Phantoms and duplications, man. You know, <laughs> so we got to be more in house with what we come up with and how we continue to ask the right questions. We got to do it in house. You know what I'm saying? We gave YouTube as much as we can give them. One hundred Preston Johns, free investigation, wave surfs, links, maps, everything. We didn't put it out for years, so I don't want to hear. <laughs> That the Nagas ain't been 100 for the knock, you know what I'm saying? And you, but everybody been able to eat off this, man, and and get that food, you know, get that za. So all praise for what. Chapter three at a place south of Egypt on the Catalan map, still talking the Catalan map, a Saracen king is described as being always at war with the Christians of Nubia, who are under the rule of the emperor of Ethiopia of the land of Prester John. But Ethiopia is below the southernmost edge of the map. Southernmost edge? We're talking Tarzan? <laughs> talking Australia's? Antarctica? 
And we learn nothing more about this. The narrators of John Day, Beth and Court's Canarian expedition speak of going to Africa to obtain news of Preston John. Which one, man? Because we know we in Northwest Africa. And Prince Henry's chronicler, Gomez N. de Zorara, writes of the explorations along the African coast that the prince not only desired to have knowledge of that land, but also the Indias, the Indies. And of that land of Preston John, if it could indeed, the search for Priest John, for the name which Presbyter Johannes in Latin and Pretre, John in French. It's simply a variant of this was considered by Zoror to be one of the main reasons for Prince Harry's, Henry's whole enterprise, the legend of the Christian prince, lived at the other flank of the Muslim world. So they had to make a Hebrew a Christian. They can't say he's just a Hebrew, you know, uh, separate from their Christianity. They had to amalgamate this because they used it to spark, you know, really um, confidence in their Christian warriors that they had helped. They wanted to show they had an ally, so they made Christian Prester from a Hebrew King David to a Christian such and such. You know what I'm saying? Just to give them some type of spark of hope. They looked to the dragon for hope. They looked to Prester for hope. The meteor, they looked to the comet for hope. Against the Muslim world, which means he could not be Islamic. Uh, you know, and that's how they take our information and write it in their books. They turn all this into an Islamic fairy tale. You can surf the wave, but these authors today is a whole new breed of authors. They ain't doing the recon and then coming up with their book. They watching videos, right? They watch our drop. And then by the time they write their book, they write it like we're speaking because they used to listening to us. So they're writing it almost verbatim, like I'm reading this stuff like I'm reading out my own head bone. But then they switch it to a Muslim flow, a Moorish flow, an Islam flow. And they had to try to recruit Presta to fight against Islam because Presta was already fighting against Islam. Fighting against the Persian and the Sultans and all this stuff. They was paying the Presta tribute. Presto wasn't walking around no cube, throwing stones to Mercurius, Merculos, Saturn and Mars. Presto don't care about your cosmos, care about the most high over everything. Yeah, so this excited Europe for nearly 300 years, but Henry the Navigator's zeal to find him may seem surprising. In the light of the dismal history of the race relations that was to ensue as a result. For by this time, most educated Europeans considered Preston John to be black, melanated Naga, right? So they're looking at Ethiopia, they're looking at Africa, you know he's a black man, right? So Stop the play play. And if he's the king of the Indians, that means a black man is the king of the Indians. Stop the play play. Your genealogy can't tie you into the kingdom of a black man or a melanated man or a copper color Indian. You got to state your claim and state your purpose. Why are you in the kingdom of the Preston? Why you get land in the Preston, in the land of Preston John? so-called America, India's period. If you're here, are you here because you're paying tribute or because you got some type of claim, you know, because you got some type of royalty, inheritance? What are you saying? You don't just get that through paperwork. You get that because Hawa gave you that lot. Hawa gave you that land. But the emperor of emperors is a naga, see? And you can't get around that. It's true. And it got you surrounded. This does not mean that they had yet specifically identi 
identified him with the emperor of Ethiopia, as we understand that today, designation today, the ge geography of the Middle Ages was too vague for this, man. So when they say Ethiopia and India, that's too vague, right? We got this. I'm just touching some bases where we started, my naga. Don't mind me. And the legend more splendid than the monarch or any monarch ever has been. In fact, Preston John had not originally been placed in Africa at all. The legend made its first known appearance in Europe in the 12th century when Bishop Hugh Jabala arrived in Rome to appeal for a second crusade on behalf of the beleaguered Christian princes that established in Near East as a result of the first. Hugh told a heartening story about a far Eastern king named simply John, a Nestorian, an old king renowned for his wisdom, who had invaded Persia not long before and conquered Ekbaktana. I'm sure that was Islam, but he's conquering it. Its capital, John, had then taken his army toward Jerusalem, intended to help its crusader king to defend against Muslim attack, but had been unable to get his troops across the Tigris, describing John as a descendant of those Magi. We've been talking Belteshazzar, Daniel, and, you know, this Saint Belteshazzar Magi flow, who had made obeisance to the infant baby J.C., cut the hijacked New Testament. We're talking Joshua and whose land now he now ruled, Hugh said he wielded an emerald scepter. And the book of Yashar talks about a sapphire scepter. <laughs> so we're just connecting all these powers. Again, we're connecting this Mongol flow, this Hindu India flow, this indigenous American flow, the China flow, the biblical Hebrew flow, <laughs> and it's all one flow. That's how we got the Presta one hano. A lot was. So look, man, there's a lot of interest. <laughs> this far flung historian. Central Asia has shown interest in Christianity from time to time. Okay, we're just talking the, the parts that connect to the Hebrew Israelites. We ain't talking no Christ business. They just told you this. The Antichrist has nothing to do with their current version of JC. The Savior character has nothing to do with JC. But the real anti-David has everything to do with J.C. So you got two anti-Christ. You got two anti-anointed. Anointed of them and anointed of Hawa. You decide. Choose your Joshua. Choose your Joshua. One led you to the promised land. He got higher magi flow. He's stopping the sun in its tracks. Stops the sun and the moon. Parts the waters. The others turning water to wine. There's levels to this, man. Hugh's story may have been based on the exploits of an actual Tartar king. The Tartars were often in contact with the far flung historians, communities of Central Asia, and had shown interest in. Christianity, we're just talking about again. They're connecting the Christianity New Testament with this, you know, connection that they try to draw between David and the Old Testament, right? The idea that they might be descended from the lost tribes of Israel also helped encourage the dream that they would one day see the light convert to Christianity. So they're trying to convert Hebrews, man. They're converting Israelite and even Thero good, you know, was talking about that's a major crux in their plan is how do we convert Hebrews to Christianity? 
So they had to invent a Messiah, you know, that they would, that the Hebrews would connect to, you know, in other words, somebody that's just like them, somebody that will have to sacrifice and be crucified and go through all this turmoil, <laughs> getting punished for their iniquities. That's the tribe as a whole, not one man. You were crucified. You were hung on tree. To this day, my knock. That's crucifixion in the book of Acts in their New Test. So they, uh, the idea that they might be descended from the lost tribes of Israel also helped encourage the dream that they would one day see the light, convert to Christianity in mass. Everybody come convert to Zeus and form the other jaw of a great Christian pincer movement against Islam. The Hebrews are against all hijacks, whether you bring them Zeus to Christianity or Muhammad through thought in them, Islam. We're against, we against all false powers. We, we MHOE, man. And of course, the example of mass conversions of the Central Asian steeps have been provided by the Khazars. Many Europeans evidently thought this had been a conversion to Christianity. Later on, there was to be a widespread but mistaken belief, uh, mistaken belief that Genghis Khan had become a Christian. The Tartar version of the legend was still strong enough in the late 13th century for Marco Polo to assume that the neighboring prince he had heard about while in Cathay was Prester John. So they had a mistaken belief that Genghis Khan converted. If they didn't convert Genghis Khan, you know, damn well they didn't convert no Preston John. <laughs> Body bag for the illusion. Hey, we in one hano. Page 43 on the bottom, it says, in fact, the Preston John letter may at least in part have Jewish roots. So they know we're talking Hebrews. They know Columbus came over here searching for the Hebrews with a Hebrew interpreter, Manage. In the desert that separates the mountains from the sandy sea, the writer tells us if an underground river lake turns into a large river in which an abundance of precious stones is to be found. Beyond this river he goes on are the ten tribes of Hebrews who thought they pretend who though they pretended to have their own kings are nevertheless our servants and tributaries. Back to the northern southern tribes flow. They are pretending as a northern tribe to have their own king. <laughs> but we know that it's the king of Israel or nothing else. One tribe, one vibe, two cross sticks together. You can't have your own king. Khan Dawi is the king of kings, the Khan of Khans. You did. <laughs> yeah, man. So they want to talk about Ethiopia, back to the fine print. The confused geography has ancient and honorable roots, ancient and honorable roots. The first verse of the book of Esther describes the realm of the Persian king Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus whose palace also was at Susa, as extending from the India even into Ethiopia, from India even into Ethiopia, in Greek and Roman authors, there is a similar vagueness about a vast region taken in by terms like India and Ethiopia. So India today ain't India. And Ethiopia today ain't Ethiopia. And I know it might hurt some people's hearts <laughs> to know that these Nagas in America are the, you know, <laughs> Ethiopian of the Far East that you know, you're getting all your clout from, you're getting your Solomon dynasty from, you're getting, you know, all your uh, Prester flow from, that America is India superior, that, you know, you people in India are getting your rich history of your, you know, your prophets and your, your code and your connection and all this flow is coming right out of India superior. So it in turn our, people into deities they didn't turn sheba into shiva you dig 
But you know how they change the B's to V's? We're just talking Ethiopia, man. So it's a vagueness when they talk Ethiopia. It's a vagueness when they talk India, right? Quote, unquote. The latter, even in its narrowest sense, comprising a much larger area than present-day Ethiopia. So that Ethiopia today can't be the real Ethiopia because it's much larger. Now we're talking uh, Grand Tartary, right? Now we're talking India Major, Asia Major, beginning with the first cataract of the Nile or Mississippi and about its relationship with the best better known Persia in the apocryphal Acts of St. Thomas, the apostle moves easily between Persia and India. Again, Persia, also a generic term for pure land or beautiful land. India, same thing. Or we're talking Indios, Hawaii's people. Starting roughly with the 5th century apocryphal writer, the pseudo Abdias, who described the exploits of Apostle Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew at each of the three Indias, this later concept became a standard one in the Middle Ages of the three Indias. The later concept became a standard one. Everybody's digging on it. One of the three Indias faced so-called Ethiopia. That's probably Africa, right? So one India's facing Africa. The second one's facing Persia, wherever that is. <laughs> and the third occupies the ends of the earth. So the current Persia, Middle East, you got one India, you got another India facing so-called Ethiopia today. And the third occupies the ends of the earth between the ocean and the rim of darkness. The third became especially fruitful. They would call this the land between the ocean and the rim of darkness. This is the land they just found. Columbus just came here, man. The third became especially fruitful for the geographical imagination as the one between the ocean and the rim of darkness. The region of untold islands, that's America. That is America. <laughs> untold islands. The Indies. The geographical imagination, because they're talking Eden, paradise in which the plural term Indias etymologically one and the same as Indies came to rest once and for all. There also were less mysterious, more valid definitions of the three Indies. Let's get it among medieval geographers, but for most Europeans, even learned Europeans, <laughs> the term covered a vast and distant region of dark skinned people. So they said that pressed is black, right? And now this region of the three Indias is covering these black people, dark-skinned people, Capricorn people, culminating in the countless array of islands in one direction in Ethiopia today, <laughs> the biblical Kush in another, man. I can't make this stuff up. Uh, we just surfing away. I mean, I really love this drop because, you know, it's also digging on this cat for the jaw, just like it talked about this Antichrist. And we got this last time about the cold file to rock and this Benjamin of Tadula describing this relationship he had heard between four of the lost tribes and a nomadic people or a wandering tribe called the Kofar or Kafar or Kafir. <laughs> right. Islam know what I'm talking about. Kafir is your infidels, right? The Dajjal, the Islam's Antichrist. I didn't know y'all had a Christ, but now I see y'all got the same Christ, same anointing. And your infidel are the Kafir, the Kafir or the Kofar. The infidel, we got the body back last time. We're just going quickly. They call it unbeliever. They call them infidels. They said it's going to be written in between uh, Pressure John's eye bones, in between his eyes. What? The kafir. Or kofir. Al Tarak. And you'll see why they're calling them infidels and anti their power because these kofars. Rocking with Preston John, 
are whipping up on so many sultans, man, that this is the adversary to Islam. <laughs> At this time, today, they got a different story about this infidel and non-believer business. That's religion, but in the real sense of the word, this Kofar belonged to this tribal title that was at war against all hijacks and they were making them flee from place to place making islam flee so they gained the title as the infidel the adversary the dajjal the kofar al Tarak evidently were not christians hell no nah. but their purported relationship with some of the lost tribes resembles that of prester john The Kofar has everything to do with Preston John. Their Antichrist has everything to do with Preston John because he ain't no believer in their bull crap. He ain't no believer in their flow. They got this some, you know, they got something called the the Ben Al Arabi or Ibn Ben, son of Al Arabi, a Muslim mystic philosopher, poet, writer who came to acknowledge, be acknowledged as one of the most spiritual teachers within Sufism, the mystical tradition of Islam, the mystics, son of Arabi. Are we talking Arab propers or Arab pretenders? Let's see, man. So he's popping up 1165, same year the Press of John letter is written. He's He's popping off during the same time as this Preston John Genghis Khan war. <laughs> Who is this guy? You know, is this Genghis Khan? Let's see, man. <laughs> All right. Producing at least 300 works on various subjects with his own mystical philosophy reaching its quintessential expression in the seals of wisdom. Fusis al-Hakim, a Khan. His teachings emphasize the potential of the human being becoming a perfect person. And he is known as the prime exponent of the doctrine of Wadad Allah Wahud, unity of being. Though he never used this term in any of his works, Ibn Arabi exerted significant influence on it, Islamic spirituality. I guess the way we're surfing is, is this their Muhammad? and more of a recent, you know what I'm saying, uh, terminology. Because, you know, some have suggested that this is Muhammad. Not only his immediate circle of friends and disciples, many of whom were considered spiritual masters in their own right, but also on succeeding generations, deeply affecting the subsequent course of spiritual thought and practice in Arabic, Turkish, per Persian speaking worlds. In recent recent years, his writings have also become a topic of increasing academic interest in the West, leading to the establishment of an international academic society whose primary goal is to further the understanding of this great philosopher's teaching huh? and putting a lot of weight on this teaching, huh? He's born uh Allah Muhammad, right? <laughs> Born in Mercia in Southeast Andalusia, Spain. You know, I mean, is this, this Muhammad <laughs> born in Spain <laughs> that was recruited to serve this purpose, in other words? We surf the wave of this Vatican, Vatican, House of Khan, origin of this, uh, you know, all the Vatican religions, you know what I'm saying? After after the fall of the press of the House of Khan or Vatican, you know what I mean? I mean, they were inventing a lot of this religiosity to control the mass. Now, this uh, Muhammad or uh, Al Arabi was immense or uh, immersed in the fertile metropolitan climate of 
Iberian Islam. He spent his youth as a student learning the most current theories of mathematics, cosmology, linguistics, and theology. As a teenager, he experienced a sudden revelation in which he was interpreted from his carefree existence by a divine call. In the middle of one of the nightly parties in Seville, he heard a voice calling to him, Oh, Muhammad, uh oh, is this their Muhammad? But we found him in the chronology. He's popping up in the 12th century. He's popping up in the 12th century. I mean, what do y'all think? Let's go. And the years that follow, so hold up. He hears a voice, the voice calls him Muhammad. It was not for this you were created in consternation. He fled and went into retreat for several days in the cemetery. It was here that he had his seminal triple vision. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Semi, semi, no, triple vision in which he met and receive instruction from J.C. <laughs> and then Moses came and gave him instruction. So this is a story, right? And then Muhammad came and gave him instruction. So <laughs> yeah. they created a story in which this Tabroni got instruction from all the heads of all the sectors, right? Christianity, Islam, and the Hebrews, right? <laughs> an illusion or excuse me an illumination that simultaneously started him upon the spiritual way and established him as a master of it and it talks about his embarking on the sacred pilgrimage but in 1202 it also talks about you know in our recon that genghis khan invaded Preston john in the same year 1202 so you're telling us Every time we're being invaded, it's some type of pilgrimage or migration of Islam or Ishmael or somebody. Every time we were getting invaded, they seem to be coming up, man. I, I just, I can't help but notice, you know. <laughs> so he's visiting the communities and initiating studying with various scholars and mystics from An and uh, Dulles and uh, and Nah. Andalus to Tunis, or we're just talking Tennis or Tennessee. In 1202, he embarked on the sacred pilgrimage to Mecca, the Hajj, where he settled down and reflected for the next three years. This period of contemplation culminated in the writing of several works, including his Magnus Opus, the Mecca Illuminations. You know, this is something that we got to pick up on because this character right here is very divine, very magical, very mythical. Uh-oh. So we got some criticisms of this guy. While Muslim orthodoxy typically uh, disdains such comments, Sufis rebut Wahhabi criticisms by suggesting that this Muhammad Ibn al-Arabi statements were, were always considered to be the most elevated exposition of mystical thought and therefore to be unsuitable for the untrained mind. Okay. We ain't ready for it. You got to get training, huh? He used words in surprising ways as a means of affirming the radical eminence of the divine. For if Allah is not in the slave, then how could the slave exist? Okay. Under the interpretation, Ibn al-Arabi statement is directly congruent with the Islamic stress on the omnipresence, omnipresence of the divine, regardless many mainstream Muslim scholars label labeled his book, Fusus al Hakam a blasphemy, causing him to be declared kafir. So even he's called the kafir. Whoa. 
So who's the real Kafar? Who's the real Kafir? Who's the real unbeliever, man? Is it JC? Who's the real Antichrist? Who's coming out of Galilee, starting their ministry at the age of 30? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Who's the real Kaffir, man? You know what I mean? It seems like this Kaffir is a reflection of themselves, man. You know what I'm saying? You know, because <laughs> our anointings have always been risen directly by what? We've been talking Daniel, Kilian, perfection of his father, El Kumisi, one of the most prominent Early scholars in Karia, Judaism, or we're just talking the Hebrew Khans from the promised province of Kumis. Like Anya, let's get it back. David, excuse me, Daniel favored a rigorous interpretation of the Torah. The following decisions of his have been preserved and is forbidden to do any work, whatever, on the Shabbat. Even to clean the hands with powder or to have any work done on the Shabbat by a non-Jew, whether gratuitous, gratuitously or for wages or any other compensation. So this was the you know, uh, description, you know what I'm saying, or discrepancy between, uh, you know, Daniel and Anon, but David, but, you know, these are sons of David, you know, they just have a discrepancy between, you know, all right, cool, you, we get it not to work, uh, but you can't even clean your hands with powder, you know what I'm saying, like, what extent to you not working <laughs> are we going to go to, you know, on this particular law, so, here they go. The burning of lights is forbidden, not only on Friday evenings, but also on the evening of the festivals in the description of Levi 23, 40 of the trees, which according to Daniel, Daniel, which were used in erecting the Sukkah, S-U-K-K-A-H, the phrase Perez Hadar, the fruit of goodly trees is more definitely explained by capon termarim or branches of palms the palm being distinguished for its beauty so daniel forbade the diaspora the eating of those animals that were used for sacrifice so like ania or anna benjamin alha Wandi and Ishmael Ayukbara, uh, Daniel forbade the eating of these animals used for sacrifice, adding to the proofs of his predecessors, others drawn from Hosea. Okay. The prohibition contained in Exodus 23, thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk, must not be interpreted allegorically as Anon interpreted it, but literally the priest carried out the injunction to wring pitch off his head of the bird. What does it mean? I mean, what does it mean? Back it up. Must not be interpreted allegorically as a non interpreted it, but literally the priest carried out the injunction to wring the pinch, pinch off the head of the bird by cutting the head off entirely after the slaughtering the clean birds are not recognizable by certain signs as the rabbinites assert but the names of the birds as found in the pentateuch are decisive and as these species expressly named in leviticus chapter eleven twenty two are permitted as food it is forbidden to eat eggs because they must be considered as living things that cannot be slaughtered, as is proved by Deuteronomy 22, 6 through 7, where it is permitted to take the young, but not the eggs. If a fish, the eggs only are permitted, the blood is forbidden. The leper must still be considered as unclean. This, too, is directed against Anan, 
who had held that the laws regarding the clean and the unclean were not applicable in the diaspora. So this is the code talk that we're having right now. Right now we're just getting back in code. You know, we, you know, number one, putting the MHOE, the most high over everything, you know, that without that, you get this, <laughs> you get destruction, you know what I'm saying? So you got that in order, you know, Hawaii ain't going to go to war with you over eating eggs <laughs> or yada, yada. But to put another power before your power, Hawaii will go to war with his own loved ones, man. You know what I'm saying? Just to prove to you that there ain't no power over your power. You know, once that's in order, then, you know, here comes these, you know, further, you know, descriptions, you know, within or really levels within, you know, how certain sections were keeping the code. Um, you know, you got Daniel, what looks like he's, you know, trying to put down certain food laws that maybe Anon wasn't really rocking with, you know, by reason of, it says, uh, he held that the laws regarding the clean and the unclean were not applicable in the diaspora. So, you know, he's saying these laws are not even applicable. They can't be applied in this particular diaspora. All right. I mean, that's just there. You know, it, it appears that these are brothers, you know, Anand bin David, son of David, and Daniel are both sons of David. You know what I'm saying? So they have their interpretations and, you know, they both want to be you know, pure. They both want to be clean, right? So the carcass of an animal, however, ceases to be unclean after use has been made of it in any way, as is proved by Leviticus, uh, what's that? Five, six, seven. All right. So Leviticus 7, 24. So this is what they're going back and forth, man. I'm just talking Daniel, you know, um, let's get right back into uh, lost tribes and promised lands. And then we're going to get back into Daniel, a little deeper into Daniel L. Kuhn. You know, who is Daniel, man? You know, I know I know the Templar is real excited to talk Daniel. You know, this is a very powerful exilarch, perfection of his father, right? So let's go. Hey, first of all, man, <laughs> y'all still got that fire burning, man? <laughs> My nigga still got that fire burning, man. Hey, crank it up, man. <laughs> hey, Allah, why? You know, we're going to act like we've been here before. You know, we have pressed to 100. We back to one. You know what I mean? And we can't do it without you. And it's been fun. You know what I mean? This has been a journey that we've all elevated these six years, going on seven years. Look at all the stuff we've gone through. Your personal lives. Things have changed. Um, and I pray that everyone's continue to choose up and try above. We've been here together this long, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, our contract with each, with each other, you know what I'm saying, remains the same, you know what I mean? That we're going to try above and keep our frequency high and keep the code, you know what I mean? So that's our commitment to each other. And that don't change throughout all these six, seven years, man. So the Presta series has been consistent and, um, you know, we want consistencies in all areas of our life, but to gain it in this type of way is very special. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I could take a pause for the calls and we can kick back, say Shabbat Shalom. By the time you're getting this, you know, it should be right on the Shabbat. You know what I'm saying? I recorded it a little earlier, but, you know, I had some difficulties, man. So I had to, you know, get everything re, uh, re-edited re for, for my Nagas. So, you know, hey, out to my Nagas, if you're just now getting this, on the Shabbat, but, um, you know, allow why, you know, all praise to so why we got the fire burning. The why die. So, hey, look out for us. You know, we're going to finish this and continue this at the same time. You know what I mean? We're going to run right through the finish line and just know that uh, this is something they can't take away from us. They can, they can watch our videos and write their books and act like it's their information and they can do all that. But they can't take this away, man. This is published work. Um, Nagas have really been on this ride, this journey in real time for years and years and years and years and years. You can't take that away from a Naga. You can't erase a Naga so that the tribe ain't remembered no more. 
they're going to try to listen to the information and write the notes and then write a book like they're having an original thought about it, man. <laughs> nah, man. Allah Hawa Shabbat Shalom. You know, Hawa knows that that's not their original thoughts or original process. So the water will always come back home. We got primary water, mem sauce, man. Love to Yosef popping out the primary, you know, rock. These fissures, man. You know, most Moses cracking that rock open. So you can't hijack the source of this material. You know, all of this is coming from the seal being broken. You know, now we can uh, get all the floodgates of this drop. You know what I'm saying? All this stuff was sealed for such a long time. Nagas just couldn't see. Nagas just couldn't hear. But now that veil is lifted, what they call apocalypse. And now we got the fire burning, man. Shabbat Shalom. Let's go. Let's talk a little while. Uh, lost tribes and promised lands. Wow. Yeah, man, turn up for a Naga, man. Let's press the 100. One hello. Uh. <laughs> it's gonna feel like this all night, man. It's gonna feel like this all day. A Lego. Yeah, we're gonna have fun. We're gonna have fun. You know, I, I had to get back into this great document here, this this great book here, you know what I'm saying, uh, by Ronald Sanders. Again, you know, this is where we started. We got a couple others that I want to pull out. OG links that we want to just reread. Uh, still got to talk some Shambhala flow, get back on our Daniel flow. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, kick the door wide open on Calais loose. You know, looking to the high Amazon queen flow, the Lake Kapala flow, the Kavera flow. Still got to dig on Ophir, Ophir. Still got to dig on the San Banyan. Still got to get into the romances, man. The, uh, you know, Wolf... Wolfram Van Etchenbach and this tutorial and all that. You know what I'm saying? We, we got to talk these things. We got to talk Sheba. We got to talk Shambhalika. Huh? You know what I mean? So we've been talking their Antichrist, their Dijal being one person, one thing, which links their religions into one thing. They're both of y'all scared of the same Naga. Both of y'all spooked of the same Naga. <laughs> Who's uh, King David spooked on? Who? Who got King King David shook? He went head up with Genghis when Genghis wanted to go head up. They went head up. It went how it went. All we do is got, you know, some recordation, but not much. But we know that that cracked it open in this more and more war. It cracked it open for these hijacks to claim our titles. Now they've fallen back in the back of our classroom, man. Let's get a couple more pieces you know, out this great book here. This is chapter 10 called The End of Preston Child. Time Without Limit, wrote Abraham Zacudo, would not suffice to relate the happenings in Portugal into which over 120,000 Jews entered from Spain and only a small remnant survived the ravages of the plague. Of these, some were taken captive, the children seized and carried off to distant lands. Others, overwhelmed by suffering, changed their religion, got converted, right? They got afraid. And, and can't nobody point no fingers, man. Like, if you got that type of pressure on you that they had, you know what I'm saying? Would you say you something else too, just to live? I mean, this is, this has been, um, you know, it's, it's survival, it's pride, there's ego, and it's maybe time to check that and say, hey, man, we got to survive. And there's certain things that you wouldn't do, and, and you'll say, hey, this is the time, this is the time, you know what I'm saying? You know, um, I'm just saying you can't judge, you know, uh, any particular family, you know, that comes under these these categories of so-called converts, that don't mean that they truly converted, you know, within their spirituality within themselves, you know, but maybe on paper they say, hey, man, I'm with you. As long as my family's straight, I don't I don't got to see them put in frying pans. I ain't got to see them slaughtered. Like, you know, what would you do? You know what I'm saying? And, you know, what's the difference between pride and ego and being brave? You know what I'm saying? And, you know, this, this bravery, 
I mean, these are all of these. All this is real stuff, man, in real time. We're just reading about it. They're going through it in real time. We're just reading about it. You did. Let's go. The long Portuguese tradition of tolerance towards Hebrews, Jews, had come to an end even before 1492. In 1481, the Cortes of Avora had given King John II official notice of the groundswell of popular anti-Semitism that he could no longer ignore members' complaints about Jews range from orientation, or excuse me, ostentation in dress to tax farming and to Jewish artisans, tailors, shoemakers, and the like, who they said entered rural Christian homes under the pretext of doing their work, but then tried to seduce the women while the men were out in the fields. The king agreed to legislation curbing Jewish sumptuary habits and reviving the ancient and hither and too long forgotten requirement that Jews wear an identifying badge on their clothing. The arrival of a huge Jewish refugee population in 1492 was therefore more than the king could put up with, although he could not resist the opportunity to fill his coffers by changing the new arrivals a large entrance ch or charging the arrivals a, a large entrance fee. So I know they're going back and forth from talking Jewish to talking Hebrew. And this is when you got to get the babies out the bathwater. You got Jews wearing badges and all that into the 40s and Hitler times. And this is what we're thinking about. But we're talking about the 1400s. <laughs> we're talking about the 1400s. So... You know, you got to use your discernment. Are we talking Jews or are we talking Hebrews? Let's keep going. But he would not allow them to stay and made March 31st, 1493, the deadline for their departure. When the time came, many of the Jewish refugees pushed on to North Africa and elsewhere. But others stayed to put this unwanted Portuguese severity to the test. The threatened penalty was enslavement to the Portuguese crown, an ambiguous state status that may even have seemed to promise advantages in the eyes of some Jews. But the king dashed any such sanguine, sanguine ex expectations, commanding according to the royal chronicler Rue de Pina that all who were minors, youth and girls alike, were to be taken captives from among these Castilian Jews. In his kingdom, who did not betake themselves away within the appointed time according to the conditions of their entrance, all these children were forcibly converted to Christianity and sent to the island of St. Thomas in the Gulf of Guyana, or Guinea, which had been discovered by Portuguese ships a little over 20 years earlier, insomuch that being separated, they would reasonably be better Christians. And it was a result of this that the island came to be more densely populated. And on account of this, it began to thrive exceedingly. So we're talking about St. Thomas, right? So indeed, it was to thrive so well that by the middle of the next century, it would be the most important intrapot between or entry point between the African mainland and the New World for the transatlantic slave trade. This is not the only instance of the persecuted being turned into persecutors during the course of the cruel age. John II died towards the end of 1492, and the accession of his cousin Manuel I seems at first to promise a better fate for the Jewish refugees who had remained in Portugal. We're just talking about the Hebrew now. Let's go. He granted them free status shortly after his accession, and no doubt it would hope that he would soon bring the converted children back to the St. Thomas exile. But then the situation was completely changed once again the following year by his betrothal, betrothal to one of the daughters of Ferdinand and Isabella. Manuel attached great importance to this alliance, hoping that a descendant of his might 
one day sit on the throne of Spain as well as that of Portugal. And he therefore was willing to make significant concessions to his protective royal in-laws. One of their demands was that their work of expulsion be completed and the entire Iberian Peninsula be made to use a most appropriate word from another time and culture, Judarian or Judarian. Judarian Manuel agreed not only to expel the refugees, but to eliminate Judaism from Portugal altogether. The degree, decree that he accordingly published in December 1496 commanded that all Jews of his realm enter or either convert to Christianity or go into exile by the following March 31st. Now, this reminds me uh similar to i guess the uh hitler situation you know what i'm saying where you know they got an option you know to push forward with the zion thing you know and become zionist and the new state of israel in 1947 and some went when they set up the new state of israel in 1947 that we call israel today but that state of israel was just set up in 1947. So where's the real Israel? Hmm. They had an option. Now, if they stay, they get treated, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like really like, like race traders because they are Ashkenazis. Hitler's a Nazi who's also Ashkenazi. <laughs> the Ashkenazis are the Nazis, but they're the real Ashkenazis. But these Ashkenazi Jews are taking the traditions and customs of, you know, melanated people, copper colored people. That's not, they're converting into Judaism. They're not true Hebrews. So Hitler's like, look, man, we Ashkenazi. We Nazis, we Ashkenazis. Y'all acting like niggas. <laughs> Y'all doing nigga stuff. Y'all y'all got a nigga customs, nigga religion. That belongs to niggas. But we ask Nazis, why y'all trying to be Jews? Why y'all trying to be converts? Why y'all trying to pretend to be Israelites? Some went and tried and said, hey, we're going to pretend. We're going to go to the state of Israel. We're going to pop off. You know, so this is an interpretation of events, in other words. <laughs> you got Nazis, you got Ashkenazis. All right. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> whatever they're calling Jude, Jude and Reen, J U D E N R I R E I N, Manuel agreed not only to expel the refugees, but to eliminate Judaism or Hebrewism from Portugal altogether. The decree that he accordingly published in December 1496 commanded that all Hebrew of his realm, either convert to Christianity or go into exile. Back to 1947 and all that stuff, you know, either you, you know, become a real Ashkenazi <laughs> or you better just go into exile and start that new state of Israel thing, you know, but you're going to do one or the other. So that was a family war. That was a you know, that was their own tribe, you know, trying to, you know what I mean, reason with their own tribe, you know what I mean? Manuel was still a true Portuguese king at heart, however, and was not so ready as the Spanish sovereigns had been to renounce an economical val valuable segment of the population merely for the sake of principle. It caused Manuel great uneasiness wrote a chronicler to think of so many thousands of people leaving his kingdom and being driven into banishment. And he was desirous of at least converting their sons. <laughs> the cruel proceeding of stealing away Jewish children, Hebrew Nagas, the cruel precedent of stealing nigger children. That's how you got to read this stuff, man. <laughs> Had already been established by his cousin. So Manuel decided to try it. Quote, he ordered 
all the sons of Jews under 14 years of age to be forcibly taken from their parents that they might be instructed and initiated into the Christian faith. This could not be executed without causing the most affecting and heart-rending scenes. Managa, this is the 1400s. This is leading into them finding you, 1492, Columbus, all that. So same thing happened with our children here, right? And everywhere that these people went, man, vicious, vicious people, man, right? Ripping the children away from their parents just to indoctrinate them with Christianity. But now we bring our own children to the church every Sunday. But ain't one word in the entire Bible about going to church on a Sunday. So what son are you worshiping on a Sunday? We bring our own children now before they had to break in our homes, steal our children, and convert them forcibly, meaning the child better listen or they're going to get the whip, you know what I'm saying? They're going to get the, the rod, you know what I mean, for not saying that their JC is Lord. They're going to get beat to death if they talk against JC. That's forcibly. This could not be executed without causing the most affecting heart-rending scenes then in the last moment before the deadline went into effect manuel turned away from such head-on confrontations and resorted to quiet bargaining with jewish community leaders he agreed that in exchange for a token conversion on their part hey just hey look i don't want to be seen as some savage stealing your children so let's 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 do it like this Just do a token conversion. Act like you converted. Right? Back to our point. <laughs> you know, not everybody that they say converted was converting. Some of them were token conversions. You know what I mean? But let's read about it. <laughs> they said, ah, yeah, man, sure, I'm a Christian, sure. But my Christ, my anointed is Hawa. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Let's go. token conversion on their part he would allow them to go on practicing judaism or keeping the code in private and would keep the inquisition away from their doorsteps again sound like star wars with these inquisitors right it's the same story man lucas is you know he, he knows the the judai jedi flow solomon you know also you know it's called uh what is it jedi or something like that so Jedi, you know, Solomon, the force, this magic. The result was for generations to come, Portugal was to be the homeland of the secret Judaism more rampant than any that Spain had ever known. So they were keeping the code as secret. But even this arrangement was, of course, unacceptable to Jews, uncompromising of their faith and a significant portion of Portuguese Jewry went into exile on March 31st, 1479 or 97. And that year, Abraham Zacato adds, there was an expulsion of Jews from the kingdom of Navarre so that no Jew or Judah as such was left in the whole Iberian Peninsula. Sound like the expulsion of these Indians, man. You know, the fact that Vasco da Gama was to leave on his historic voyage, first voyage to India later that year, calls to mind the striking confluence of similar destinies involving Jews and the Columbus voyage in Spain five years earlier. Indeed, from the days of Master Giacome, Right down to the expulsion, men of Jewish descent had been playing as important a role in the Portuguese enterprise of discovery as in the Spanish one. So just like they say Louis de Torres, this convert, 
you know, uh, came to speak Hebrew to the great Khan. We read that. They knew they was coming to the land of Hebrews. Managa, that's why they had a Hebrew interpreter and Arabic, right? Because we know it's a more and more war. You got to speak both. <laughs> So it says men of Jewish descent or Hebrew descent have been playing as important a role in the Portuguese enterprise of discovery as the Spanish ones. So Naga Ibarus were playing important roles in both discovery, whether you're talking Spain or Portuguese. Got to get that through your head, bone. That's an important line, man. This chapter is called The End of Prester John. Keep it in your mind, Bone. This is Prester Juanjano. We popping off. Nice and smooth, man. <laughs> we gonna act like we did this before. We gonna meditate. On our Shabbat, we gonna just uh, have a nice relaxing conversation. We got the fire burning. Water's flowing, allow well. <laughs> Men of Hebrew descent had played, been playing, been playing as important a role in the Portuguese enterprise of discovery as in the Spanish one. We have already noted the presence of Joseph Vizzi, Vizinho of Lisbon and Abraham Zacato's disciple and translator in the Portuguese Royal Commission that reviewed and rejected Columbus's plan in 1484. So he reviewed and rejected Columbus's plan. We're talking Jewish and we're talking Hebrews. He's in an important position, just like Daniel, just like David, just like, you know what I'm saying, uh, Yosef, you know what I'm saying? Naga's being raised up no matter where they are. Moshe, he became the king of Kush, the king of Kush for 40 years. We're going to get some uh, Jashar, Yashar flow, Hashar flow. We're going to get some Hashar and press the 100. <laughs> we popping off, man. So we always been raised up, man. This is an interesting you know, situation where this Naga rejected Columbus's plans in 1484. Later that year, this... Vicino and one Master Rodrigo, another Jewish savant or Hebrew savant who had sat on the commission were sent on a voyage down the African coast to gather astronomical, astronomical geographical information. Having rejected the Western route, they clearly were part of the project that when that was then underway to open an Eastern one to the Indies. Indeed, three years later, at around the time of Bartholomew Diaz, Diaz, departure on the voyage that would take him around the Cape of Good Hope, at last, Vizinho and Master Rodrigo were among those upon called upon to give instructions to two men who were about to leave on an important geographical mission in the Middle East. Its purpose was twofold to try to ascertain from that side, whether Africa was indeed circumnavigable and to obtain information about Prester John. Body bag for the illusion. Every time you relax, Prester just pop up, bump. <laughs> pop up on us man he just said hey what do you do oh you thought you were just talking about Portuguese and Spanish and discovery you can't talk discovery without talking about me you can't talk crusades without talking President John you can't talk Columbus's plans in 1484 without talking President John in the next paragraph Presta John was a big part. You know, the Grand Khan was a big part of Columbus's plans. We already read it. He want to conquer the Holy City. He want to conquer Mount Zion, which means conquer Presta John. 
Oh, they had a twofold purpose to see whether Africa was indeed circumnavigable and to obtain information about the Presta, Presta John, King David. The two men, Pedro de Covilhan and Alfonso Paiva, traveled together in the Mediterranean to Egypt and then to Adan or Aden, A-D-E-N, where they separated. Paiva headed for Ethiopia in the company of the Jewish merchant of Cairo who went or who knew the way. Kovilhan went to India where he spent a few years making voyages with Arab merchants down the East African coast. Returning to Cairo, he learned that Paiva was dead and had left no account of his discoveries. This information was brought to him by two Jews from Portugal, one a rabbi, Abraham of Beja, Beja B E J A, the other a shoemaker named Joseph of Lameco. According to existing accounts, surely none other than Abraham Zacato, who lived in Beja after the expulsion from Spain, and Joseph Vizinho, Vizinho. Assuming the disguise of a humble occupation to protect the secrecy of his mission, Covilhan sent Vizinho back to Portugal with the report of his travels and observations and set with Sacuto to Ormuz, apparently in an effort to determine for once and for all whether Preston John's realm was in Persia or not. But where's Persia? I'm not talking about Iran today. I'm saying, where's the original Iranistan? <laughs> the original Persia. We're just talking about a fruitful land. And when they talk Presto, they're talking promised land. Man. Not Middle East. <laughs> not Africa over there. But Ethiopia over here. The Abyssinia. The mixed multitude. The seed of Dawi. The Meshika, the Amaruka, so they wanted to know whether or not Preston John's rim is real. You know, is it around here? Is it in Persia? Where is it at? At last, satisfied that it was not in Persia. Zakoto headed home while Colvin had traveled, remained his travel. They're looking in all the world for you. This is why they venerate Christopher Columbus as a Saint Christ of Ophir. This is why he is Saint Christopher that they put back in a timeline to 200 AD. <laughs> they went back 1800 years for that, dropped him off over there dog-headed so you don't understand man saint christopher is like to them you're moses you know what i'm saying he found the Presta's land he found the gold california gold rush told texas montezuma's treasure he found what they you know the cities of gold to an extent of what they have discovered which we know they haven't found everything they ain't found everything folks you know, Antarctica is a big piece. It's a big piece. So this is their saying. That's why he's Christ of Ophir. But we're going to get on Ophir, but Christ of Ophir, right? He, he became the anointed of Ophir. The cities of gold, because he found you. They're looking in Persia, right? Zakatu, you know, is going to Ormuz. Apparently, in an effort to determine for once and for all whether Preston John's realm was in Persia or not. And when they didn't find it there, he headed home while Colvinham resumed his travels going on to the Hajj, to Mecca, disguised as a Muslim, and finally reaching Ethiopia. There, he ceased to be heard from, at least for the time being. So we know where Mecca is. <laughs> we know what they're walking around in Illinois and Indiana. I mean, 
we're talking Columbus, so America is in, in play, right? <laughs> Possibly some of the information relayed to Portugal by Vizenho and Zacuto from Calvahan and from a wide network of largely Jewish sources have been discouraging for although Diaz had brought back his good news in 1488, it was not for another nine years that a voyage to India by the route around Africa would be attempted. Apparently the prolonged illness from which John II finally died in 1495 also had something to do with the delay. In any case, Manuel wasted no time about resuming the project after he succeeded to the throne, but unlike or but like his predecessor, he decided that a little Jewish advice might be useful before going on. <laughs> because it was fitting in this matter, writes the chronicler Gaspar Correa. Correa. <laughs> Man, all right, let's go. I'm just looking at this Korea name, Gaspar Korea, and then you got this Korea, you thinking it's just, you know what I mean? It's like you got Spanish Korea, and then you got Korean Korea, or this is all this the car, you know what I mean? <laughs> car titles. And also because he was some little inclined to astronomical matters, the king sent to Beja to summon a Jew with whom he was very well acquainted, who was a great astrologer named Zakatu, speaking to him in great secrecy, the king as Zakuto, to use his good science to assert whether it was advisable for him to engage himself in the discovery of India. He's like, man, should I even dig on this India superior business, man? The Jewish savant Therabad returned to Beja, presumably to consult both his astrological and geographical charts and after a while came back to the king with his reply sire he said with the great care which i have taken in the matter which your highness so enjoined upon me and with the great pleasure of our lord that which i have found out and learned in this province of india is very far off from our region this province of India superior is very far off from our region, far removed by wide seas and land. So you know we're not talking to India on that side of the world. If it's far removed by wide seas and lands, man, <laughs> that's a body bag for the illusion. He's talking to India. He's in Europe or Spain, whatever, talking about India, which... You can literally just <laughs> take a voyage straight, probably all by land to get to India. They know India over there, but this India they talked about, remember these are vague terms. Indios, people of Hawa, in Hawa, in Co. Supposed to be in Co. Better be in Co. To be Indios. Far off from our region is this India superior, man. Far removed by wide seas and lands, all inhabited by dark people. Whoa. Whoa. Right. And we know, you know, we, we dodged the English spell. You know, we know dark, you know, they talking wicked, but um, we know we're just talking complexion here, man. Right. So. Now, these people in India, did they say they're from Africa or are they in some outer region far removed by wide seas and lands? And they're still dark people. So they just found you dark people over here. <laughs> but we know we got copper color cons, the land of the Prestigeon, in which there are great riches and merchandise which go forth to many parts of the world, and there is much risk before they can come to this, our region. That which I have looked at by the will of our Lord has attained to it, to is that your highness will discover it and will subjugate a large part of India in a very short time. Because, sire, your planet is great under the sphere, <laughs> under the sphere, 
the device of your royal person in which are contained the heavens and the earth. For God will be pleased to bring all this into your power, which God, which God, man, which power will never end for the king who fears God, even though he spent his whole kingdom in this because God kept this enterprise reserved for your highness. So we know Hawa gave us over to the heathen, and maybe that's what they talk about, you know. Um, even with the Babylonian flow, the Cyrus flow, Nebuchadnezzar flow, Hawa was raising up the heathen, you know, even the out of cold heathen. You know, he said, hey, y'all don't want to be in cold? All right, so I'm going to let these out of cold niggas <laughs> come holler at y'all since y'all want to play this out of cold business. Y'all want to play this out of cold game? Y'all want to play a game called out of cold? All right, I'm going to holler at Nebuchadnezzar because he's the king of this out-of-code stuff. Let me see how big and bad you are in the world of out-of-code. But if you want to be in code, you in your own lane. As soon as we got in code, we got our own lane. Drop nation, our investigation. We ain't biting off nobody. We ain't in nobody's, you know, classroom taking notes, trying to build our investigation up. We just build it and we dig on it in real time. You see us wave surfing in real time, off the dome, my popping off. We all doing it. We all doing it. We've all contributed to President John 100. I'm just warming up, man. Let's go. Wow. According to Korea, these words were all the king needed to make him go ahead and call for the outfitting of the expeditions that was to be led by Vasco da Gama. You see all this in that um, animated series, Cities of Gold, Love to Freddie B. We're going to get back on our Cities of Gold. We earned it, my naga. We're going to watch cartoons for a long time, man. <laughs> We're going to watch cartoons for a long while. And y'all ain't going to say nothing about it. Grown people watching cartoons, y'all ain't going to say nothing about it because we earned it, man. We're going to watch cartoons about the cities of go, and you're going to sit back in the back of the class, and you're going to be entertained, man. <laughs> Hello, wow, man. Shabbat shalom, wow. We popping off. But Zakudo's services were not to be confined to such astrological pep talk, for he had a good deal of practical knowledge as well. Korea tells us that Gama, just before his final departure from Lisbon, held a private and apparently very secret meeting with Sakudo in a monastery in which he received from him much information as to what he should do during his voyage and especially recommendations of great watchfulness never to let the ships part company because if they separated, it would be the certain destruction of all of them. Elsewhere, Correa suggests that one of the things Sakudo gave the Gama was exact information about the southern confirmations of the African coast. No doubt he also gave him some pointers on the use of the astrolabe, A-S-T-R-O-L-A-B-E, -E, an instrument that had become a trademark of the Jewish cosmographers in Portugal. So this astrolabe became the trademark of these Hebrew cosmographers. Well, you know, we don't know what y'all think. We're talking Jewish or Hebrews. I guess we got to dig on the astral low because if it's hijacked, we must be talking Jewish. You know, <laughs> it is no surprise that the Gamma's meeting with Zakuda was so secretive since the latter should have been out of the country by then. This was already some three months after the deadline for the Jewish departure for Portugal. For a man so useful as Sakudo, an exceptional evidently had to be made. An exception evidently had to be made. Indeed, Correa suggests he did not leave Portugal for good until 1502. He had, how had he managed to stay on all that time? Perhaps he had even undergone a token of conversion to Christianity. Did this Hebrew convert? Or do you think they're converting Jews? <laughs> Nowhere in their history 
You know what I'm saying? Are they, as Jewish people, being forced converted to Christianity? Man, all that stuff is Indian talk, man. Black talk, Naga talk, nigga talk. Forced converted to Christianity, yeah, that got the nigga code all over it, man. They got the nigga DNA all over it, man. They only really force us into that because we are the real Hebrew. So anytime you hear them talking about converting Jews, ding, 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 just let that bell ring and know that, uh, you know, we in here. You know what I'm saying? They were first forced converting our families, whether they call us Indians or, you know, uh, Jews or Jewish they force converting us to their Christian faith. Correa suggests that he did not leave Portugal for good until 1502. Okay. Let's get it from here. How had he managed to stay on all that time? Perhaps he had even un undergone the token of conversion to Christianity, as we know Joseph Vizenho to have done token conversion not even a real conversion but whatever temporary course he may have taken in religious matters temporary course because you know a token conversion is a temporary course he at that he at any rate according to Correa, died in the era in which the enemy had blinded him having acquired such knowledge of the stars and remaining blind in such a bright day as our holy catholic faith we last hear of him wandering in the Middle East, perhaps hoping for the final resting place in the Holy Land, perhaps lifting his cosmographer's eyes to some yet more distant oriental horizon. Oh, they want to go to America. They want to talk East now. The great interest shown by Correa and other Portuguese chroniclers of that time in Jewish participation of the discovery of India does not quite stop with the Gama's departure. A significant bit of Jewish history makes its way off to confusing, but without fail, into all the narratives of his return trip. After leaving Calicut, the Gama's fleet put in for a refit at the island of Anded and Anjediva, <laughs> A-N-J-E-D-I-V-A, Andjeva, <laughs> below Goa where according to the anonymous diaries of the voyage, quote, there arrived a man about 40 years of age who spoke Venetian well. He was dressed in linen, wore a fine toko on his head. Takao, toko. What's a toko? They spell it T-O-U-C-A. Let's see what that is. It was like a hat or a turban or what they got. Okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, so I'm getting turban vibes out of this, man. <laughs> what do y'all think? Yeah, yeah, I'm getting turban vibes out of this. <laughs> Let's go. So he wore pretty much a turban on his on his head. All right, where we at? All right, and a sword on his belt. He had no sooner landed than he embraced the captain major and the captains and said that he was a Christian from the West who had come to his country in early youth that he was now in the service of a Moorish lord who could muster 40,000 horsemen, that he too had become a Moor, although at heart still a Christian. Yeah, I'm definitely getting turban vibes, man. <laughs> All right, let's go. Korea corrects the anonymous diarist on this point, telling us that this interesting stranger was a Jew from Granada, who upon the taking of a city by the Spanish Christians, let me back it up, telling us that this interesting stranger was a Jew from Granada, right? Palm of Granada, back to Calais, he came from the West, right? He's a Hebrew from the West, from Palm of Granada, 
Now, whether he's a, you know, Moabite or an Ammonite or an Israelite, you know, he's being called a Jew from Granada. Okay, so upon taking the city by the Spanish Christians had wandered to the east, other writers of the period agreeing that he was a Jew, alternatively give his place of origin as Egypt or Poland. At any rate, all agree at his strongest desire, that his strongest desire was to return with the Gama's fleet to Portugal. And to become a desire or to become a Christian. So they're trying to say his, his main desire was to become a Christian. Okay. <laughs> the Gama finding him to be in the possession of extensive knowledge about the Indian Ocean and its trade route. This is how they got man. Look, man. He's just said he's in service of a Moorish lord and that he had become a Moor. So he wasn't a Moor be before he became in service of this Moorish Lord. And then they're, he's, they're calling him a Jew, right? So is he a, a Hebrew, uh, you know, an Israelite so-called, you know, that converted a couple times, did a couple token conversions into Christianity, into, you know, Moorish, you know, science, whatever the case is. Either way, he could be from America and now he got all the drop on the Indian Ocean, right? This is how they found us, right? We know that on, you know, Columbus and the Nagas on this boat, they knew exactly where to go. They knew exactly where to go. They had Hebrew interpreters, man. They had Hebrews with them. You know, we, we over here fighting our own people. They doing treaties against us too. Making deals with the devil. The adversary. Extensive knowledge about the Indian Ocean he had and his trade routes comply with his wishes on both counts, baptizing him on the voyage home and giving him with no excess modesty the Christian name of Gaspar de Gama. Whoa. So when we when we see this Gaspar de Gamba in the cities of gold, he just looks like a typical Spaniard that you would think of as a Spanish person today. We know that these Spaniards back in the day, this meant swarthy. These were swarthy, you know, dark skin, copper tone, copper, you know what I'm saying? These are Hebrews. These are Moabites. These are all these different things, right? So they're all being titled these different things. That's why you can't just take one narrative and start popping off. You got to really... You know, put everything in a balance, man. And even Gasper may have originally been a nigga from America, man. You know what I'm saying? A more from America. Hooking up with uh, these, uh, you know, Zacutos and, and you know, Correas and all these other uh, conquistadors, you know what I mean? for money say hey I know the way so this is the Ga Gaspar the Gama is the Moor got it <laughs> Gaspar shipped out as a pilot on the next Portuguese voyage to India under Pedro Alvarez Cabral and continued playing a prominent role in this enterprise during the su succeeding years but the enthusiasm shown by chroniclers over Gaspar's arrival on the scene seems to go beyond beyond his mere practically practical view or value shall I? so the enthusiasm shown by chroniclers over gasper's arrival on the scene seems to go beyond his mere practical value rather one can perceive beneath the surface of their accounts a sense of symbolic importance of this episode which tends to read like a ritual summing up the Portuguese conquest of the Orient. Now we're talking the Far East. Now we're talking America. And the fact that these colonizers, <laughs> they, they, they're being called colonizers in our history book. <clears throat> 
But these colonizers, some of them were from here. <laughs> made deals with them people over there. And brought them people over here. And made treaties from that point on. That's how much they not only hated Israel, confederate against Israel, but they just were greedy, man. They, they were willing to turn everybody over. They were willing to have your children be slaughtered so they can get their riches. Just like Avatar, these people are living an indigenous life, sitting on a gold mine to them or whatever, you know, minerals. And these people only see the minerals. They don't see the people on it. You know what I'm saying? They want to clear out the forest. They want to clear it. They want to kill everything to get to the minerals. They want to kill to get rich. Because Hawaii never knew them. So they've always been, you know, like that stepchild that never got love, you know. They cling to their own false gods and false idols. And all they know is fake love. Because they turn on each other and stab each other in the back in a heartbeat. For the goal, yeah. <laughs> they stab each other. They stab their mama in the eye for that goal. This is who we're dealing with. It represents a final settling of reconquista scores for the portuguese who have reached both physically and spiritually the outermost goal in that drive to exercise and then take under control the southern and eastern components of the iberian civilization our view of this history has been primarily from the castilian perspective whereby we have seen the final expulsion and conversion of the Jews of the realm that take place within the framework of the final act of reconquesta on Iberian soil. You remember from um, Forbidden Histories of America by Daniel Lowe talks about these Israelites that were, you know, having to flee to Western Spain and set up shop in Western Spain and help defend, you know what I'm saying, the righteous, you know what I'm saying, the, the vortexes from certain Muslim armies out there. So these were all niggas. These were all nagas. They were already fighting these Muslim armies. These, this more and more war was already popping off from here and there. They just want what you got. They just want your gold. They just want your things. Could you ever try a boat with them? They look like us. Are they our brothers? I would love to drop it all and say, hey, man, that was the past, man. Let's tribe up and do something righteous. But is it in them? For many, no. For a few, yes. And if that's you, you listening, and you say, hey, man, I was on, a, I was on the other side of the Kumsay War. You know, my, my people for sure, you know what I'm saying, went with that treaty flow or, you know, uh, I'm just not down for this you know, uh, hatred no more, you know what I'm saying? Then my Naga tribe up with a Naga. But we know that that's going to be few. It's, it's not going to be many because it's, it's not in them, you know what I'm saying? It's in them to annihilate their own brother, their own sister. Our view of this history has been primarily from Castilian perspective, whereby we have seen the final expulsion and conversion of the Jews of the realm take place within the framework of the final act of the reconquesta on Iberian soil. To a certain extent, the Spanish history of the ensuing century will continue in just this way in the new world, as well as the old, as a series of quixotic, Q-U-I, X-O-T-I-C, Head on efforts to stampede and swallow up the enemy, the Spanish Inquisition would have this character too. But this would this was not the way of the small people who, in the generation that saw the author <clears throat> Shalak of uh, Don Coyote or Don Quixote grow to maturity, was to produce as its own great national 
literary literary work and an elegant pastiche pastiche of latin and italian epic styles that uh, telling the story of vasco da gama's historic voyage louis de camions c-a-m-o-e-n-s or luisadas the deft portuguese did not charge into problems and continents but outflanked them by the time of da gama's voyage portuguese africa was simply a chain of coastal trading points on the way to india and the technique of control by enclave would now be extended in the next few years to the entire northeastern circumference of the indian ocean and it says this approach was transforming vast areas of the world into networks of portugal's portugal's of islands and coastal enclaves with one foot in the sea ever ready to maneuver okay we're gonna get this last piece right here the approach taken by the portuguese to the jewish question was another version of this they outflanked it instead of attempting to stampede it and swallow it up in the Ca castilian manner they imposed a mass conversion upon their Jews, but allowed them to go on practicing Judaism in open secret. They expelled those who refused to convert, but seemed to have held on to a few among them who were useful. Useful like uh, Abraham Zakatu. At least for a while, the Jews were, after all, preeminent instructors in the kinds of knowledge the Portuguese most needed for their own particular brands of reconquesta. So they needed your knowledge still. They had to keep you alive to this day. In a sense, they were the very model for it. The most Portuguese of all people scattering their enclaves into the farther most orient, gathering knowledge from all the corners of the earth, but bringing it back to where? In every age there, are always some one or two countries whose Jewish communities or Hebrew communities are the central repositories for Hebrew learning and aspirations throughout the world. And Portugal evidently went on thinking of herself as one of these, even after the mass conversions and expulsion. So even after the mass conver conversion and expulsion, they still consider themselves a major repository of Jewish or Hebrew knowledge and learning high level magi flow because whatever the preston knew is at the highest levels of academia we're talking voiding manuscript right we're talking heavy heavy encryption right <laughs> quite typically wanting to have it both ways she saw herself above all we're talking portugal as the homeland of the great tradition of jewish cosmography brought to her by master jacome of majorca and if a man like Abraham Zacato felt finally left her bosom, even this was no disaster because the success of his own services had in the end rendered his services obsolete. The ideal Jewish geographer of Portugal's new era was one who knew the Orient at first hand and who was furthermore happy to accept the new religion disp dispensation. So Abraham was still... He never converted like that, right? So he's still a cold keeping nugget, right? But now they say, hey, we need someone who's able to fully convert. So Gaspar de Gama was the ideal. And this, remember, that's the more, right? He already converted. And so he's more ideal now than Abraham because he's really ready to spread their Christianity. And this is one reason why he looms so large in the Chronicles as a symbolic or as a symbol and not just as a man. Gaspar's advent and conversion did not stand merely for the conquest of the Orient. However, he also represented its demystification when Vasco da Gama's ships at last led the way through the southeast corner of the Okanimi, penetrating through the ancient imagination or imaginative haze into the clear light of scientific geography. They found on the other side not the lost tribes of Israel, but a wandering Jew. 
<laughs> Apparently, if European and perhaps Iberian origin at that, Gaspar's return on board was like the black captives coming back from Guinea voyages, a symbol of reducing and taking in hand of the awesome South and East. Man, okay. We're talking about black captives and Gaspar back to the moor flow. They're throwing out the lost tribes of Israel, you know, because that's what they're looking for. But in this case, they just found the wandering Jew. The most dramatic of such demystifications, however, took place a few years later in 1520 when a Portuguese diplomatic mission arrived in Ethiopia. <laughs> Listen up. And the blurred and dreamlike vision of centuries hardened into focus. What the guest found was not the jewel-studded rim of Preston John of legend, but the thatched roof and hewn rock of the kingdom of Lebna Dangles. So they went to that Ethiopia looking for Presta, and instead they find the kingdom of Lebna Dangle. All right, let's go. The mission's priest and chronicler Francisco Alvarez was no doubt thinking of the fabulous processions of the former when he described the kingdom of those made by the real life monarch. The monarch who he and the Portuguese continue to refer to as Preston John in spite of everything. So he's trying to tell them, I'm not that Preston you're looking for. They're like, yeah, you are. <laughs> We're going to continue to refer to you as Preston John because you in Ethiopia, you got your kingdom. You must be Preston John, right? He's like, no, nah, I'm just letting them, man. <laughs> It is unbelievable how many people always travel with the court for certainty, certainly for a distance of three or four leagues from each place of which they break camp. The people are so numerous and so close that they look like a procession of corpus domini in a great city. The tenth part of them may be well-dressed people and nine parts common people, both men and women, young people and poor, some of them in skins, other and poor clothes and all these common people carry within their property, which all consist of pots for making wine, poor, pouringers for drinking. If they move short distances, these poor people carry with them their poor dwellings made and thatched as they had them. If they go further, they carry the wood that is some poles. Rich men bring very fine tents, I do not speak of the great lords and great gentlemen because each of these moves a city or a good town of tents and loads <laughs> and people on mules and a matter without numbering or reckoning. So they're moving together. They, they tribed up rich and poor, everybody eating. If they go short distance, they just take the, the house. They just pick up the house and take it. If they go in the long distance, they carry the wood. So they can build a new house. I mean, that's how Naga's building Nagaville. I do not know what to say of those on foot. We Portuguese often talk of these mules because in the winter, the court does not move with less than 50,000 mules. And from that upwards, they might reach 100,000. 100,000 mules are most impressive, but not in the way of the same number of cavalry men such as the legendary Preston John brought in his train so and they're like he, he might not be Preston because he only has a hundred thousand mules but Preston got a hundred thousand cavalry men at all times right it was this mission that finally learned the whereabouts of Pero de Colvinhan who had not been heard from since his parting with Rabbi Abraham at Ormuz nearly 30 years before he was living in Ethiopia as the courier to the king, a kind of Marco Polo of the South, but with one important difference, he was not permitted to leave. So the whatever Khan took him in, in Ethiopia, whatever Ethiopia he was in, said, nah, you ain't gonna leave because you might tell everybody where I'm at. You can't leave. <laughs> So he told his whole story to Alvarez, how in 1493, he traveled by land until he reached the Prester John. I'm sorry. Didn't Columbus supposedly find us in 1492? 
So at the same time, the Nag is being discovered in America, Preston John is being discovered in Ethiopia. I'm seeing some phantoms and some duplications, man. Let's go. And he came to the court and gave his letter to the King Alexander, who was then reigning. And he said that he received them with much pleasure and joy and said that he would send them to his country with much honor about the time he died and his brother Nahum Ray. Nahum, okay, sounding like some Hebrew flow. Who also received him with much favor and when he asked to leave, leave to go, he would not give it. So he said, look, man, my, my bro wouldn't let you leave. I ain't gonna let you leave. <laughs> And Nahum died, and his son, David, Lebna Dangle ran. So now, Lebna Dangle comes to the picture, son of Nahum, also called David, who now reigns, and he says he also asked him for leave, and he would not give it, saying that he had not come in his time, and his predecessors had given him lands and lordships to rule and enjoy, and that leave he would not would not give him. And so he remained. Alvarez adds his own observation saying that Colvin, Colvin huh, was given a wife with very great riches and possessions. He had son, he had sons by her, and we saw them in our time when he saw that we wanted to leave a passion, a passionate desire to return to his country came upon him. He went to ask the leave of the Presta, and we went with him, and we urged it with great insistence and begged it of him, yet no order for it was ever given. So he's like, look, I can't let you leave because you might snitch on us and everybody going to come looking for us, but I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you riches. I'm going to give you a wife. <laughs> you got everything, man. All right. But you can't leave. <laughs> you can't leave. So he too was a living symbol of demystification of the East, ending like the legend of Prester John in the Abyssinian Desert. in the Abyssinian dust. Why did the legend of Preston John end in the Abyssinian dust? With that legend went for the time being all hope of a noble image of the Negro to counter the one that was coming with growing force out of West Africa. Body bag for the illusion. One hundred. Shalawa to the tribe. With that legend went for the time being all hope of a noble image, my naga. But Hosea 3 say, man, you're going to go a long time without a prince. Yeah. We're about to get on our Daniel flow. <laughs> What Hosea 3 say, man, this is Preston 1, honey. Got to hit Hosea 3 for the home team, man. And Hawa said unto me, go, yet love a woman beloved of her friend and an adulteress, even as Hawa loves the children of Israel. Though they turn into other gods and love cakes of race. You bacon raising cakes to the queen mama, the queen mother. No, nah, that ain't the real Amayu. You bacon raising cakes to the hijack, the hijack deities. 
So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and a homer of barley and a half homer of barley. And I said unto her, thou shalt not, or <laughs> thou shalt not play the harlot. <laughs> thou shalt sit solitary for me many days. I got ahead of myself. Thou shalt not play the harlot. You going to sit your ass down. If I got to buy you out of uh, your harlot tree. If you're selling yourself to these other nations, these other powers, let me buy you. You ain't going to be no hoe no more. You're going to sit your ass down. <laughs> you're going to sit solitary for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot. Thou shalt not be any man's wife. Nah, nor will I be thine, man. He, he's treating you like a, a promiscuous wife, you know. That's the type of oath. That's the best way Hawaii can show you the, the bond and the oath, the connection as like husband and wife. And then you see comparisons as father and son. Or mama and daughter. How how many ways can Hawa describe the closeness and the connection and the oath, the family? You only have I known Amos three, the family affair that's going on. But if you don't want to be in this family and if this ain't your power, make your decision. Choose your Joshua. Play the harlot with their JC if you want to. In the name of your Shai, Yeshua, if you want to. But you ain't going to be no hoe no more. You shall not play the harlot. You shall not be any man's wife. You shall not have no other oaths, my naga. Nor will I be yours. So I can't even be your your husband right now but you ain't gonna be no other man's wife that's for sure but you've disgraced me so i can't even be in a bond with you right now israel we can't even be together right now but you ain't gonna be no hoe no more i'm gonna buy you back for half home or barley verse four for the children of Israel shall sit solitary many days without a king without a prince without sacrifice Without pillar, without ephi, without tear feet. But I believe in you. My mercy is forever with the house of Dawid. And afterwards shall the children of Israel return. I believe in you, man. My mercy is forever, man. I know y'all going to choose up. I know what type of energy you got, what type of spirit you got. I know what type of flow you in. I know you're going to choose up. I know you made some mistakes. You've been a hoe. You've been a hoe. Do you acknowledge you've been a hoe? Chasing after their Moneta Juno? You made money your God? You'd rather make your money than serve the creator? You shall sit solitary many days. You don't know this kind. You don't know about your last royal, noble image because you sat solitary, Hosea 3. Many days without a king or queen, right? You need a king and a queen. A Sheba got to be in the flow. You've sat solitary without your nobility, without your prince, <laughs> Right, you don't know about no Levitical nothing. You don't have no priesthood. But I remember you. I ain't gonna be no liar to David. I told David I'm gonna be there for his children forever. I'm gonna be there for the children forever. Psalms eighty nine. Afterwards shall the children of Israel return you back, my lady. This ain't by no accident that we all press the one huddle. <laughs> this ain't no accident, man. What? A, hey, look, man. 
This ain't no accident. These niggas ain't supposed to be here. We on our Tupac flow. Rose out the concrete flow. The cons are rising out the concrete. Con. While laying down the concrete for Joy World. Con. The water to the contributors. Shabbat Shalom. So afterwards shall the children of Israel, Hasharah, return and seek Hawa and Dawi, their God, and shall come trembling unto Hawa and to his goodness. When? When, my nugget? In the end. When? In the end of these days, man. You forgot about your last noble image. You've sat solitary many days without a king, without a prince. You forgot about your nobility. Yeah. With that legend went for the time being, all hope of a noble image of the Negro. What, Negro? We're talking to you, Negro. You a Negro? Oh, you a Negro now? You a Negro now? You lost your nobility. You just a Naga from such and such. You from this block. You from this street. You from that set. You from this organization. This fraternal order. You do all this to compensate, to try to be important, because you lost your nobility. You, you overcompensating to be important. You want a bunch of paper money, man? They playing with us, man. You lost your nobility. When the copper colored naga had all the gold, didn't have to do nothing but wake up and till his land and make sure everything was in order in your house. But you lost your nobility. With that legend went all hope of a noble image, nobility. What legend? We're talking about the end of Preston John. Ending like the legend of Preston John and the Abyssinian dust. They switched the narrative. Now we some niggas from West Africa without telling us that we in West Africa. Can't make this stuff up. Man. I can't make this stuff up, man. <laughs> right. More of Maxim, West Africa, America. Body bag, body bag. Body bag for the illusion. Body bag for the illusion. Hey, meditate on this, man. Just looking at this map, it says now Northwest Africa, maximum over North America. Southwest Africa, maximum on South America. Come, come. Oh, Morocco, you boast yourself above the root of the tree. This is your problem and this is your curse. I don't have to know you. Looking at your story, this is easy work. This is like a psychiatrist. Y'all need a psychiatrist, man. You know what I mean? Psychologist, psychiatrist, you know what I mean? I need somebody to talk to that will look in your eye and say, stop boasting yourself as if you're the originators and originals and originators and originals. You're coming out of Lot, not Abraham. You're coming out of Lot. Lot was just trying to rock. 
He was scared to walk alone without Abraham. But Abraham see, well, that's us. And Ishmael, I'm talking about Arab proper, not the Arab pretender. Because Arab is a rabbi. Arab is a rabbi. Allah wah. Where is North West Africa? With that legend went for the time being all hope of a noble image of the Negro to counter the one that was coming with growing force out of West Africa. Well, first they had to convince you that you're not in West Africa, where the original Atlantis and Egypt and Old World resides, which is what they've always known the whole time. We got to wake up on our own. We got to take our time to wake up on our own, right? Y'all looking at us like, finally you waking up, but you also looking at us like, whoa, they waking up on their own? I better start backing back because this power they're coming in might be the real thing this time. <laughs> the prophecies lining up. Our oracles are telling us to back back. We're trying to curse these Negro, Negroes, these Nagas. And even our high priests are saying, no, I can't do that no more. I can't curse the children of Israel. I can't make sure their name ain't remembered no more. I can't cut them off from being a nation. I can't be a hijack no more. A why to change their hearts. And the people you rely on to curse us can't curse us no more. So your hatred got you in solitary, you feel alone because the power you serve serves me. The power you serve serves the house of Israel. Satan is walking to and fro, jamming people up late to the meeting. He works for the creator. So the adversary that you were serving this whole time that got you some hookup because we was out of cold and we didn't do exactly as Hawa told us to do. You were here to test us. You were here to prove us. You were here to make us ready for war. More and more. That was your purpose. Now, what are you going to do now? Now that your purpose is fulfilled, you're going to get in line. You're going to get in order. Or you're going to see, you're going to witness, then be a witness. With that legend went for the time being, all hope of the noble image, because you've been in solitary of the Negro, Naga, to counter the one that was coming with growing force out of West Africa. So now you think West Africa is a whole nother place, right? <laughs> Body bag. One of the most vivid depictions of the West African image now taking shape in the minds of many Portuguese can be found in the Esmeralda de Cito Orbis, a geographical and historical handbook of the African coast written in about 1508 by Duarte Pequeco Payera, from which we have already quoted with reference to Master Jacome of Majorca. Pequeco had worked for years as a civil servant in various parts of the growing Portuguese empire and had an intimate experience of the African slave trade and all its ugliness, the result in this apparently somewhat sensitive man is a bitterness turned not against the exploiters from among his own people, as might have been the case in the later, later era, but against the 
abject African participants in the trade. So this Duarte Pacheco Pierre wrote this handbook, this geographical, you know, this Esmeraldo historical handbook of the African coast from which we already quoted with this master Jacome Majorca. Pacheco had worked for years as a civil servant in various parts of the growing Portuguese empire and had an intimate experience of the African slave trade and all the ugliness. So Pacheco was in the shits, right? The result in this apparently somewhat sensitive man <laughs> is a bitterness turn, not against the explorers from among his own people, as might have been the case in a later era, but against the abject African participants. Quote, for a poor horse, you can receive here six or seven slaves. <laughs> for, he writes typically of one, let me say that again. For a poor horse, you can receive six or seven Nagas. That's how many they had. It was just supply and demand, like, you know what I'm saying? They had an abundance of Naga slaves. Such an abundance that they can give six or seven away for a bad horse. He writes typically of one place on the coast with equal contempt for those who hand in human beings for horses and those who are thus handed in goes on to warn that quote the captain who is engaged in this barter should guard against these negroes for they are bad people the loathing that perme permeates his descriptions begin gradually to extend to physical characteristics some which are wholly imaginary as he describes them for example the inhabitants of this region have the faces and teeth of dogs and tails like dogs they are black and shun conversation nothing or not liking to see another man so they made a monstrous because the more savage you make us the easier it is to remedy yourself of what you're really doing you can kill a savage but it's hard to kill a man it's easy for a gang to kill a gang because you're a savage and you're a self-proclaimed savage and i'm a savage and you you get this title and yeah you get you know some love and respect in your hood but you also just made yourself a target because it's super easy to kill a savage it's super easy to want to kill a savage but a man, a man for the people, you know, that takes a lot more hatred. You know, it takes a lot, you know, it comes from another place. It's not like shooting a dog, even a dog, you know, <laughs> it's hard to shoot a good dog. But a ravenous, a ravishing dog that, you know, just wants to bite you. Oh, well, yeah, it's easy to shoot that dog. <laughs> so they got to make you savages, even savage dogs a great multitude of new peoples and black men he said <laughs> but but Pacheco only rarely indulges in such departures into medievalism from sound if contemptuous observation and when he refers elsewhere to a great multitude of new peoples and black men in Africa, whose color and shape and way of life, none who had not seen them could believe. Calling them in yet another place, quote, almost beast in human form. This is what he means by, with that legend, all hope of a noble image of the Negro to counter the one that was coming with greater growing force out of West Africa. Because look at the images on the television of these big black brutes, right? And they always did this savagery in their illustrations of us, these, these uh, 
you know, watermelon eating, big lip, big, you know, all this chicken, chitlin circuit niggas, you know what I'm saying? Like they, they made it, they always did that. This, this Samboism, even though we know Sambo is actually, you know, an Israelite con, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, they, they, they put these depictions out there to dehumanize because your noble image is gone. You might see a nigga in a suit dressed up. You might see a nigga in Versace and Balenciago and Gucci and whatever else they got. Louis Vuitton, you know, on his plane, he's flashing his money. He got the new pair of whatever's on, private plane, Lamborghini, uh, Bugattis, you know, whatever they're driving, you know, uh, Phantom, you know, whatever they drive. <coughs> uh, Maybachs, you know, Rick Ross and them, the big houses, but royalty is different. And when they do show royalty, they always show African royalty, right? Uh, coming to America, but they still are showing you this connection with African royalty in America subconsciously. Even uh, Black Panther. You got this big Oakland, California flow connected with the Black Panther. He just ain't no regular African, right? He had to have some of this Oakland, you know what I mean? Shout out to Oak Town, man, you know. Frisco, what it, what it do? Vallejo, what it do, man? You already know what it is. Richmond, what it do, man? Hayward, what it do? Stockton, what it do? Fresno, what it do, man? Modesto, what it do, man? All the homies out here in California, what it do, man? Let's go. Yeah, you gotta have some of this, you know, <laughs> Cali swag in your in your Black Panther, right? Which we know the Hawakas love to cool in Mayo. All this has to do with South America. So Monaga's doing great work out there because we are, you know, uh kicking down the veil of hijack city. So no more noble image. Now we got dog headed, dog face. Now, now now Satan puts his image on you now you the devil with the horns now you the savage beast in human form he makes it clear to his readers that he is speaking of men and women any one of them may have seen coming off the slave ships it is a doomsday vision evil repulsive men sending out cargoes of other men who seem hardly more than beasts in exchange for trivia and it is colored black. A true child of that callous and coldly theological age, Pacheco saw suffering in other men as the outward sign of Hawa's contempt for them, God's contempt. And like many other Europeans, he considered blackness to be another such sign. So you copper color races found here must be a curse even though they can't figure out our melanin and they're the ones running from the sun, not us. <laughs> Must not be a curse when it comes to the sun. Must not be a curse when it comes to the sun. Con, con. I mean, we're going to put it together in real time, man, in battle time. Okay. Okay. So now it's a curse. He says, uh, <laughs> A true child a true child of that callous and coldly theological age, Pakeko saw a suffering in other men. As the outward sign of God's contempt for them. And like many other Europeans, he considered blackness to be another such sign. In one particularly striking passage, he joins the growing chorus of those who in his day were rejecting the old and relatively humane climate theory of color. Now we done touched on this in the races of men that everything's in reverse right nagas get darker as they approach the poles according to robert knox as they went to the polar regions nagas got even darker <laughs> not lighter so that flips their whole everything upside down if a naga gets darker as you approach the poles 
then maybe it's leading to regions of more dark skin, copper color, you know, Nagas. Many of the ancients said that two lands lying east and west of one another would both have the same degrees of the sun and would be in all things alike as their equal share of the sun. This is true, but such is the variety employed by the majesty of great nature in their creative work that we find from experience that the inhabitants of Guyana are very black, whereas the inhabitants of the same latitudes beyond the ocean to the west are brown, almost white. These are the inhabitants of Brazil. If any should ever, should ever that they are white because of the many forests which protect them from the sun, I would answer that there are as many and as dense forests in the eastern side. And if they should say the inhabitants of Ghana are black because they are naked and the inhabitants of Brazil white, or they just said brown, right? Because they wear clothes. I swear that nature had given them an equal privilege in this, for they are all naked as when they were born. So that we may say that the sun affects them equally. And now it only remains to know if they are both descended from Adam. Whoa. <laughs> so we're talking about the original tribes of creation. Let's get it. The theory of differing racial lineage is, in principle, good modern anthropology, but it is characteristics of Pacheco's time that the step cannot be taken into it without one's including the notion that the different race must be outside of the family of the elect, or as in this case, outside of the human family altogether. So they went from brown and now they're just talking to white Brazil, but if they're just talking white, <laughs> so-called white, you know what I'm saying? They're really kind of questioning their own origin saying uh are we all from adam hmm. the different race the white race must be outside the family of the elect hmm. or as the case it as is the case as in the case outside the human family altogether hmm. are these so-called whites outside the human family altogether. Well, we don't know, we don't know. You might see somebody you think is white, but they really have, you know what I'm saying, your you know, DNA in them. And then you might see someone who you think looks like you, but they really <laughs> got straight up hijacked flowing through them. And you know what I'm saying? So I don't judge and we can't judge by this and that. We just go off the vibration, man. You really force, you really force. You're not forced, you ain't with us, man. Whether you're from Adam or not, a hijack is a hijack. Our main enemies are from Adam. So, you know, what is that saying? So, you know, this don't confuse or diffuse or excuse the so-called whites <laughs> and the evil of these heritages and lineages and the parasitic behavior that we've witnessed. But it is to say that you can't judge a book by its cover that certain whites might be you, might be Jacob, might be, you know, F. Ryan, you know, just, you know, in a different, you know, mix at this point. But their soul bone might still be solid, you know what I'm saying? So you might have a so-called white that'll come to your rescue faster than a so-called black. And that's hashtag fact. Because all skin folk ain't kin folk. And all kin folk ain't con folk. So, you know, stay at a high frequency, man. That's the best I could tell you, you know. Just uh, observe the frequency. And if it's not about proving yourself to anybody, it's just like, yo, you're here to help, then help. Don't even try to be like, I'm you, I'm you, I'm you. Just help, you know, just be there. Just keep it cold, you know what I'm saying? Because the more you try to prove yourself, the more it seems like covetous, you know what I mean? Like you really want to be us for real, for real. And that's a, you know, a, a, a not so, it's more of a disheartening or it doesn't make it easy for a Naga to vibe up 
if you're constantly trying to be a nigga. But if you be you and give the AI, that makes it easy. You know what I'm saying? Because you are you. <laughs> but if you try to be me, but me ain't you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so come humble and be you. Be yourself. And, uh, you know, just, just come in the pure water. You know, if you really want to help a nigga, you know what I'm saying? Because Nagas have it hard. We got it bad. We're trying to figure us out. And we still got to figure you out and try to discern who you are as you see us growing and rising. We got to really discern who we allow to help us. All help ain't good help. You might you might think you're giving good help, but come with all this baggage and all this emotion and all this drawn out, you know, behavior. You know what I'm saying? Where you're putting yourself in all these situations and you want everyone to help you, but you put yourself in these situations and now you got to help yourself. You got to rely on the creator. You got to put yourself in a better position. All help ain't good help. Or you can come and, and, and just make things easier for Naga, make things easier for the tribe. And now you, you know, are choosing up and, and, and you know, it don't mean everybody, you know, don't go through suffering. You know what I'm saying? But there's a way to do it, man. There's a way to help, you know, without it being a manipulation, acting like you're helping, but really you are the one that want the help, you know. Either you're helping or you want help. You choose. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a frequency war. And as far as complexion and as far as what we can prove and our genealogies is this, I just keep the code. I ain't trying to prove myself to you. I ain't. Not one time have you seen me spoke about my genealogy and what I can link myself to on paper. I'm popping off, man. How about you? Let my work speak for itself. Then you can lead me to whatever you want. I'm going the opposite, you know, direction with this. We're going the opposite direction with that from you. You want to prove yourself. We ain't trying to prove ourselves. We just want to prove the creator. We just want to keep it cold. Because we've gone a long time in solitary. And we're tired of it, man. Israel shall sit solitary many days when I come. We're tired of it, man. We want to return. Israel wants to return. See Kawah, their power, and David, their king, their Khan. We want our Khan back. We want our royalty back. We want our nobility back. They took our nobility, man. Put us in this crux here, man. We forgot who we are, man. Press the light. Y'all must have forgot. You ain't had no noble image at all. You just got presidents and vice presidents now in three-piece suits. No fine linen. Y'all forgot. <laughs> this is what's happening, man. Shout out to the Aqua, man. The caller of Morris woman. I, I'll call you a queen in Nagaville. She like, y'all must have forgot. Y'all had no noble images. Nobody you've seen. Noble. You just got governors and Senates and Congress. Con, con aqua. We must have forgot. But why did we forget? Why do we forget about Kilia or Daniel, who is the second son of King David, David, king of Israel? Nagas without blemish that Nebuchadnezzar is summoning these royal seeds without blemish in Daniel chapter 1. Daniel, son of King David. Yeah, the King David, <laughs> Daniel, 
in the book of Daniel, they don't say he's David's son, but they say that Nebuchadnezzar is summoning the royal seas of the house of, you know, these of Judah, you know, the, of, of, of Israel, you know what I mean? Here, here, here comes Daniel. Daniel was considered for the throne of Israel. Why? Because he's David's son. Though being the second son, oh, he was not a contender for the throne because he was the second son. <laughs> so yes, yeah, Solomon, you know, popping off. I guess it's based on marriage and all that, right? So even after the death of the firstborn Amnon, the thirdborn Absalom, and fourthborn Adonijah, he may have died before his father. Later rabbinic traditions, traditions name him as one of the four Israelites, ancient Israelites, who died without sin. And in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar wanted the royal seeds without a blemish. And these are the Nagas without transgression. They keep the code is all that means. You know what I'm saying? You also got Benjamin and Jesse or Yeshai, who is David's father, and Amram, who is Moses' father. Right? You got Yeshai. Shout out to Yeshai, father of Dawi. So Dawi is coming from this sinless man. <laughs> is Jesus coming from a sinless man? or Oh, he's an immaculate conception, but he still calls himself the son of David. Got it. How can you be? How can you be the son of Dawi? You don't have no daddy. You got the, you got your God as your daddy. <laughs> or some angel that's your daddy. But who's your daddy? <laughs> well, David's father is a sinless naga. That's pedigree. Who became king of Israel. His son, David, is simply called the son of Jesse. Oh, so everyone's called son of David now, but David is called son of Ben, son of Yeshai, Ben Yeshai. The role as both father and King David and ancestor of Jesus. Whoa, how can he be? Jesus is an immaculate conception. But he had to hijack into the David line. He had to hijack into the David line. But he's an immaculate conception. <laughs> Come on, make it make sense. You can't have no daddy and then say he's from the seed of David, man. Just say you from God. Why ain't it? Why is it not enough to be the son of God? Why? Why must you be an ancestor of David? Why must you historically tie yourself into the rulership and the house and the inheritance of Khan Dawi? Because we know the covenant is with Dawi. Jesus can't rock without it. David can rock without JC, but JC can't rock without David. But he's an immaculate conception, dog. The tree of Jesse, yeah, man. He wants to be of that tree, right? It's funny how that Jesse, you know, being a perfect man, you just switch the S and the E and you get Jesus. Uh-oh, <laughs> let's go. Phantoms and duplications. Nagas without transgression. Gilead. Right, because according to the Rashi Rabbi, Isaac said that some question whether Abigail was pregnant through David or her first husband, Nabal. She was a widow. Hawa arranged that Kiliab or Daniel would resemble David. <laughs> so there's no question about it. His name means perfection of the father. So imagine Daniel in his perfection. Imagine Dawi in his bond being a perfect resemblance, a perfect perfection. This is why Nebuchadnezzar summoned Kiliab or Daniel as long, along with uh, Michelle and Abednego and all them, right? Come.
Okay. Yeah, we coming in hot with this Daniel Alcoon. And how does he historically lined up with the actual Daniel or Gilead? Knowing how important he is, knowing he's the son of David, we got to investigate Alcoon a little further, man. And you know, man, we've been over here bound, you know, <laughs> talking about this, uh, Arabis and Musta Arabis and air proper flow. Definitely got to get back on this 10 Lost Tribes link. And yeah, 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 we popping off, man. Okay. We good, we good, yeah. And yeah. The Fords of the Wilderness, the Ford of Anya. An eastern river, river draining into the Dead Sea and the forge leading to Babylon, presumably through the Euphrates. Yeah, we're going to talk way more on this Antion as well, man. So, yeah, we got the Nam and David flow. Again, Antion is Anon. Anon is having a little personal beef with his bro, Daniel, because they're both sons of David. But let's continue over here. Still got that uh, fire burning, man. <laughs> okay, we popping off. Yeah, we popping off, man. Allah, wow. So the last part of this chapter is uh, still talking about this dehumanization. With these examples, we can see the dehumanization of the West African proceeding hand in hand with the demystification of the East and the con, the concomitant disillusion of the ideal idea of the noble Ethiopian. So now it's a disillusion. Your nobility is a disillusion. Wow. Disillusion, disappointment resulting from the discovery that something is not as good as one believed it to be. Disillusionment. Continue disillusionment. Disillusion of the noble nobility, the Ethiopian, the Abyssinian. Something was not as good as it was intended to be. Huh? It is significant, moreover, that we see Paqueco speak of the Negro this way in the context of the comparison between him and the New World Indian, although we have seen the concept of the undifferentiated southerly world of black devils, quote unquote, appearing as late as the 1520s in Pigafetta's account of the Magellan voyage. It is Pacheco's view, the unfavorable comparison hinted at by both Columbus and Peter Martyr that will come to the fore and prevail in the ensuing epic. Whatever the Indian is to suffer, he is to emerge gradually as a full-fledged member of the human family, even when feared and despised the legacy and the experience of the fresh Western horizons will work in his favor in this respect, but the human condition of the Negro circumscribed with chains of the body and spirits as Africa itself was by the trade routes of European ships was with only occasional and fleeting expectations not to be thought about for some 200 years. Yeah, but what were they thinking of <laughs> when they first started popping off? What it? What was? What was on Columbus's mind <laughs> when they were popping off? And 
we still got some chapters that we got to read in this book, man. Like this one, man, the Black Devil chapter. Actually, I think we probably did do a drop on that, but you know, we've been popping off, man. <laughs> but just the intro right here again in this chapter, this gold world flow. Again, the high sea was most necessary for me, Columbus wrote in his journey, journal, September 23rd, 1492. 17 days out at sea after a month-long stopover in the Canaries. By now, the crew were becoming restless, and there was loud grumbling among them that they would, not, that they would never get back to Spain. <laughs> it sounds like Moses, right? Wasn't he getting grumbled on, too? Why'd you, why'd you bring us out of Egypt, man, to die in the wilderness? Hmm. They had encountered few winds blowing back eastward, and on this day the waters were so becalmed that the sailors claimed the sea simply was not high enough to bring them home again. But then the waves rose dramatically without even a wind, so that everyone was astonished and silence for the time being. This is when Columbus made the entry, just quoted, high seas, right? <laughs> Let's go. This is when Columbus made the entry, just quoted, adding that nothing like this had ever been seen. Save in the time when the Jews went out of Egypt and complained against Moses. Whoa, come on. <laughs> Who had brought them out of captivity. So in his mind and in their reality, Christ of old for Columbus is their Moshe. You know what I'm saying? He led them out of that captivity into the promised land. That's why they got Columbus Day. Christ of Ophir Day. We do not know much concerning Columbus's crew of about 90 men aboard the three ships, but at least one of them was an Israelite whose presence as such was not merely accidental or accidental. This was Louis Torres, Louis de Torres, a convert of possibly only that year. So he can't be an Israelite. He just converted to Judaism, but he does know some Hebrew. He was said to have known Hebrew, Aramaic, Aramaic, and Arabic, which is very important for the biblical flow, right? And had been brought along by Columbus specifically as an interpreter. You don't think Columbus knew who he, who he would be meeting and, you know, be encountering? You don't think Columbus thought about this and meditated with due meditation that he was going to meet the great God, that he better bring a Hebrew interpreter. He better bring an Arabic interpreter too, because, you know, it's a more and more war. You got to speak to both sides, right? <laughs> and Torres was to be that mouthpiece for this encounter, presumably on the basis of his Hebrew, perhaps Columbus and his supporters had decided that the great God reported on by Marco Polo and others might be, might be the Israelite king who dwelt across the river from Prester John. Now, whether it's someone claiming to be the Israelite king when Prester John is in truth the Khan of Khans, or are you talking about a northern southern tribe flow where the northern tribe is still pretending to have their own monarchs and acting like David ain't the con of cons? You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, you got a king of Israel and a king of Judah, right? In the, in the Bible, right? So, you know, what Israelite king is being compared to the great Khan who dwells across the river from Preston John? If this is 1490 something, it's well past the Genghis Khan invasion. They been stole the title Khan. And anybody in the flow of the Prester at this flow, at this point, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a myth. <laughs> Your last noble image, I mean, you know, it's all mythology now. It's all mythos, man. Let's keep going. Yeah, we're talking that uh, Kumisi flow. Let's talk about it. Daniel Kumisi, <laughs> Daniel Kuhn, I'm just going to call him Kuhn, man. Daniel Kuhn was one of the most prominent early scholars of Karyat Judaism. 
He flourished at the end of the ninth or the beginning of the 10th century. The reason why we're looking at this time period is because, you know, according to, you know, certain, you know, chronographers, you know, uh, masters of chrono chronology like Anatoly Fedomenko, we're talking about chronological time shifts, 300 years, 1,000 years, 1,800 years, you know, so these things actually happen. So you might be getting history from the 1400s that was pushed back to the 900s, 800s, or history that's coming out the 900s, in this case, that might have got pushed back to the BCs, like the Book of Daniel. We're going to talk about the dating of even that and how that corresponds to one of the main chronological time shifts. So put the dates out your head. And when they say Judaism and all that, just think Hebrews, think Hebrews, think Hebrews, and try to match this up with the biblical flow of biblical Joshua. <laughs> Connected with the Belshazzar flow, right? Because didn't Daniel get a name change or something like that? I got to pull that one back up. Daniel chapter one. Okay, well, this is when Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came in the year of the reign of Jehoiakim. King of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebo, defend my boundaries, right? King of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, besieged it. And what did he want? He carried all the, all the gold, right? All the things, all the vessels. And the king spoke to his chief officer that he should bring certain of the children of Israel of the royal sea and the nobles, youths, in whom was no blemish. Gotcha. And we popping off with Kiliad, <laughs> who died without sin, who is the perfection of David, who is Daniel. Ka. Daniel, whose name has changed in Daniel 7. Let's see. Is it seven or five? Let's get it in verse five, chapter five. Okay. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made proclamation concerning him that he should rule as one of three in the kingdom. And that night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. Darius the Medi received the kingdom, being about three score and two years old, 32. So you got Belshazzar the king, which again just refers to, you know, someone protecting the kingdom or defending the kingdom with the power of their bear, right? So they switched Daniel's name. Let's see if we can find that. Let's check it right here in verse 8. It says, Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation. Then was King Belshazzar greatly affrightened, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were perplexed. 
Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house. The queen spoke and said, O oh, king, live forever. Let not your thoughts affright you, nor let your countenance be changed. There is a man in his kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him. <laughs> they just talking about mama, <laughs> that mem song. And the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father made, made him master of the magicians, enchanters. So they're, they're letting him know Nebuchadnezzar been put him on because he made him the master of the magis, enchanters, <laughs> the wizards, <laughs> Chaldeans, astrologers, for as much as a surpassing spirit in knowledge and understanding and interpretation of dreams and declaring of riddles and loosing of knots were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will declare the interpretation. So Daniel, son of David, is raised up by Nebuchadnezzar because he has all this magi flow. He gives him a name that correlates with his gods, Belshazzar. Kilia, Daniel, Belshazzar, all the same people. Belshazzar, let's see. Oh, yeah, we got that fire burning <laughs> for the Presta. One hundo. Checking out this Belshazzar flow, wherever I put it. You know what I mean? I, I put out all the stops. I make sure. <laughs> I make sure we didn't forget about nothing over here. Man, we got our Shimbala links ready for the dismount. Okay. Getting back into that forbidden histories flow coming in hot. Want to talk a little more about that Sheba flow as well. I'm just getting tapped into the tabs, man. <laughs> you know, it's an art form to be able to navigate. Still talking Voinic, man, because they still talking Voinic. We still got to crack this thing, man. What y'all think, man? Y'all feeling some type of way? We going to crack it? All right. We're coming in hot. We're coming in hot. St. Belshazzar, back to them chronological time shifts. We done shifted back to uh, pretty much uh, the year one. <laughs> they got black face popping off about this Belshazzar. They, <laughs> like many uh, traditional Christian countries, stage pageants that include roles for the three wise men in mainland European countries. It is customary to for Belshazzar, based on St. Bede's or Betty's description of him to be portrayed by a person in blackface. Or they'll hire now, you know, now <laughs> it's more customary to hire uh, a resident of African descent to take on this role. So you might see a situation like this now. Representing St. Belshazzar. They say, hey, can we get a nigga to play this role? Hey, cool. And look at his top. Blue, purple, red. 
white linen gold thread. You think it's play play? This nugga right here. Is Daniel, love to the Templar. <laughs> he said, man, that's Daniel. Blue, purple, red. Oh, he's from Africa, though, you know. Okay. Three wise men, the Magi, have been going over and over, you know, with this Preston flow, these three wise men. They want to make Preston one of these, you know, Magi's that visits baby Jesus. Oh, baby Jesus. <laughs> Cut it, man. Cut it, man. Belteshazzar, along with the other magi, are purported to be buried in the shrine of the three kings in Cologne Cathedral, following his remains being moved from Constantinople by Eustrogius in 344 AD. In 1164, Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbosa moved them to Cologne. Belteshazzar is comm commemorated on Epiphany with the other members of the Magi, but in Catholicism, Balthazar's feast day is on the 6th of January because it was the day he died. Now they rock in the blackface. And then they got this Gasper flow, which we just talked a little bit about a Gasper, you know, in uh, the Lost Tribes, right? Uh, you know, same or nothing, I don't know, but let's go. Balthazar and Gasper are characters in the 1880 novel, Ben-Hur. Then they come out with a movie called Ben-Hur, right? A tale of Christ and the various film adaptions of the work, of the novel, which chronicles his last year. Man. So they made this Daniel figure bowing down to their baby Jesus. Now, you know, the book of Daniel was in the Old Testament, right? And it's Jesus is coming later, right? But it's overlapping for them because they pushed you back so far to usher in their baby Jesus. How does he relate with Preston John? Well, if this is King David's bond and this is the Preston son, if this is King David's son, it's the Preston son. Perfection of the Father. <sighs> Forever will I keep my, will I keep for him my mercy. I will appoint him firstborn. The highest of the kings of the earth, my naga, the highest of the kings of the earth, and my covenant shall stand fast with him and his seed. Also will I make to endure forever. How long, how much longer shall we endure? Psalms 89. I have made a covenant with my chosen I have sworn unto David, my servant. So we're just talking David. How did they get to Jesus? Why does he got to bow down to baby Jesus? Hijack city. That's called indoctrination. False flag and false genealogies, false history. Forever will I establish your seed and build up your throne to all generations. So. The seed of David ain't nothing to be playing with, boss. All this have I spoken before the second address, chapter six, verse 55. Because, a why, because you made the world for our sakes and for our people, or excuse me, for the other people, <laughs> which also come from Adam. So before they're trying to make these comparisons with the seed of adam you know oh these darker people might be from the seed of adam and then the white people 
are they really from the seed of Adam? But even if you are from the seed of Adam, Moab, Ishmael, Amalekites, Edomites, Jebusites, Israelites, that don't make you righteous. Righteousness is a choice. But even these other seeds of Adam, these other people, which also come from Adam, thou hast said they are nothing, even if they're from Adam. Compared to the children of Jacob that are keeping the code, not out of code, but keeping the code, the seeds of David that are keeping the code, because if you an out of code seed of David, you're going to get it worse, man, because there's higher expectations from you. The whole much is given, you know the rest. Much is expected. But them other, you know, tribes coming out of Adam, according to Second Edges chapter 6, Hawah, because you made the world for our sakes and for the other people which are from Adam, you have said they are nothing but likened to spit, man. That's not a diss. That's just showing there's levels to this Ahab from the creator, this inheritance, this heritage, the seeds of Dawi, and has likened the abundance of them, these other nations, even if they are from the natural creation, even if you are from Adam, you steal nothing. If you ain't KTC, if you ain't keeping no code, the abundance of you is like a drop in the bucket, like a drop that falls from a vessel. And now, Hawah, behold, these heathen that are nothing, which have been reputed as nothing, have begun to be lords over us and to devour us. I wonder why. Were we keeping the cold, Edris? But we, your people, whom you have called, thy first born. First born, Dawi, first born address. First born children of Israel. We, including address, are the first born. You're only begotten, Amos 3. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. You're only begotten, your firstborn, and your fervent lover. Back to Hosea 3. You, you ain't going to be nobody else's wife. You ain't going to be no hoe no more. <laughs> so this is a comparison to the bond, to the oath, to the marriage. To the bond, my nigga. Your only begotten, your firstborn, your fervent lover, and we are given into their hands. If the world now be made for our sakes, why do we not possess an inheritance with the world? How long shall this endure a while? Where's your inheritance, Managa? We happy to get an acre of land. We call it Joy World. We build a fence <laughs> on an acre. But where's your inheritance? How can they give up 30 million acres in a single treaty? Where's your inheritance? How much of that is your inheritance? A thousand acres, a few thousand. They gave up 30 million. In one treaty, that Fort Wayne joint, right? Chapter 7. And when I had made an end of speaking these words, there was sent unto me the angel, the dragon, which had been sent unto me the nights before. And he said unto me, get up, Edris, <laughs> and hear the words that I come to tell you. And I said, speak on, my God, or, you know. You bring in the words of Hawa, speak on. Then said he unto me, the sea is set in a wide place. 
that it might be deep and great, but put the case, the entrance were narrow and like a river, who then could go into the sea to look upon it and to rule it? If he went not through the narrow, how could he come into the brawl? <laughs> this is upper level magi wisdom, man. He said, look, man, you got to go through those narrow straits to get to that broad open sea. But everybody can't go through the narrow at the same time. <laughs> There's also another thing. A city is built and set up upon a broad field and is full of all good things. The entrance, therefore, is narrow and is set up, set in a dangerous place to fall, like as if there were a fire on the right hand and on the left a deep water on one only and one only path only one path between them both so on one side you got the fiery pit the other side you got deep water which one are you gonna choose <laughs> you gotta walk the path even between the fire and the water so small that there could be one man go there at once if this city now were given unto a man for inheritance, if he never shall pass the danger set before it, how shall he receive this inheritance? You want me to give the inheritance to all the children before they've had a chance to cross the narrow path? Only one can go at once. And then he went into, you know, a mother, you know, having children and, you know, hey, go tell her to have all her children at once is what you're asking me. Like, how long will this endure? Everyone has to cross that path that needs to cross that path so we can all hit the broad open water together. And then together we have our inheritance as a collective. But you got to wait to all the Nagas wake up, man. They all got to cross that path. They all got to go through that fire. You going through that fire? We with you, my Naga. Let's go, because we got more Nagas that need to cross <laughs> that path. You get through that fire, make room for the next Naga. Let's go. That's what's happening. Whether it's one by one or a few at a time, everybody ain't popping off at the same time. You've been able to witness that a few Nagas at a time. Mama got to give birth again. Allow why? El Kumisi. Well, let's talk about the date of this book of Daniel right quick. Yeah. Take it into Daniel El Kum. So. It's a little small. I'm trying to get it bigger. It's a lot bigger. <laughs> All right, that's cool. That's cool. So, look, they don't know. Long story short. <laughs> but from there... Well, let's read what they say. It is no accident that there that the three most attacked books of the Bible are also the most significant: Genesis, Daniel, and Revelation, which we know is a reflection of the Book of Daniel. It is commonly known that if the foundation is faulty, uh huh, the building will soon fall. This article will seek to refute the view that the book of Daniel was written in the second century BC and thus could not have been written by Daniel. And they said circa 622. This being the case, the issue of the date of Daniel will be addressed first. So because there's a chronological time shift, <laughs> uh, either it wasn't written by Daniel or you're going to have to push the date of Daniel uh, back into its position, you know.
one of the arguments put forth seems to indicate a late date. <laughs> Second century BC for Daniel is its place in the canon. So in the canon, they say it's taking place Second century BC. English versions of the Bible are based on the canonical order given in given in the I guess it says 50, 60, 70 or 70 books. I don't know. Something about 70. As such, Daniel is grouped with the three major writing prophets, the Hebrew canon. However, the book is positioned with the writings, Ruth, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, 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 Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of, Song of Songs and Lamentations. Critics believe that since the writings were collected after the prophetic canon was closed, Daniel could not have written or been written in the 6th century. The critics' assumption is wrong. A number of the Psalms and Proverbs were composed between 1020 and 950 B.C. Man, that's hot, the events in the book of Job likely happened in the days of Abraham. And some even say that it's one of the first books, right? Or the first book. They go back to the 2000 BCs to pop off of Job. And I like that comparison only because with this Leviathan flow, it kind of gives you a clue to what happened to Atlantis. Like this Leviathan could have easily taken out those uh, fake continents, <laughs> you know, uh, beside and build a lot of fake islands, you know, so, you know, maybe that's what fell, you know what I'm saying, but let's go. Therefore, finding Daniel among the writings does not require a late date. The Masoretes 750 AD to 950 AD may have moved Daniel from the prophet to the writings since much of the book is history and because daniel was not a commissioned prophet prophet to certain people so these masoretes are popping off when <laughs> 900s <laughs> what did uh Fermenko say most of the your organic real history is coming after the 900s and being put back in the past 300 years a thousand years, eighteen hundred years in some cases, and even just jumping ahead to their conclusion. You know, they keep getting this, you know, JC flow with it, but Daniel was a historical person who lived in the sixth century then they went back to this Nebuchadnezzar flow Miller concludes well let's go right here it says moreover Belshazzar bestowed upon Daniel the third not the second most authoritative position in the empire so who's Daniel the third and who's the second? The truth is not Nabu or Nebu Nidus was not in Babylon in the time of Cyrus's invasion. All right, so they're trying to pinpoint it, but they're throwing different dates around. And I just want you to focus on this sixth century situation, man, because again, we're getting more and more recent when it comes to Daniel. Back to this Daniel El Kun. We got a piece of this earlier about these legal, you know, uh, disputes between Anan and Daniel. 
in regard to Leverite marriage or, or, you know, marriage according to the book of Leviticus. Daniel agrees with Anon that Ahim does not mean brothers, which would violate the prohibition contained in Leviticus 18. But relations, the story of Judah and his sons proves nothing because at the time the prohibition against marrying a brother's wife did not exist. The prohibition contained in Leviticus 18 cannot be taken literally as the rabbis or rabbinites take it. For the wife's sister is forbidden under any circumstance, just as is the husband's brother. It is rather the stepsister of the wife that is meant in the passage in question. So these are, these are, you know, those small details, but really major details, you know what I'm saying? Is that permitted? Is that not permitted? Is it the what, you know, the uh, stepbrother, or the, you know, all this. So this is, you know, these are their differences. Oh, no, nah, man, you can't, you know, marry your um, uh, wife's sister, you know, but stepsister <laughs> is cool, right? <laughs> so that makes more sense. Stepsister of that wife that is met in the passage in question, the daughter of the father-in-law's wife, whom the last named had by her first husband. In this case, the prohibition ends with the wife's death. The daughter is not excluded from the heritage, as the rabbinites say, although her portion is less than that of the son being only one third for in the law of valuation in connection with vows, women were valued less than men. So, you know, all this is high chat because Queen Sheba wasn't popping off like that. <laughs> in conformity with law, with this law, the mother also receives one third. Daniel was possibly influenced here by the Shahara or Shahara. They're bringing some Quran flow in, in other respects. So he may have been influenced by the Quran. Like, come on. In other respects, Daniel follows the Talmud in holding that the descendants of one entitled to, one entitled to a portion succeed to his entire rights. The children of the son, i.e. grandchildren, take, take precedence over the daughter, their aunt. Finally, Daniel holds that responsibility for the observance of the commandments must begin not with the 13th, but with the 12th or 20th year that the new year begins on the 10th of Teshri as follows from Ezek, E-Z-E-K. -E so they had these different, you know what I'm saying, details about how their law was flowing and that Muslims also may act as witness on the new moon's appearance. So that was also up for dispute. Daniel wrote several works in the Hebrew language, all of which, save for a few quotations and fragments, have been lost. Why? Why, my night? Lost or hidden, right? Because his works had to do with the legal code. There's undeniable evidence that he compiled a legal code a Sefer Hamid's Woe, a Book of Commandments, and a work on the rights of inheritance, the latter against which Saudia directed his polemics, polemics, was perhaps merely a part of the code just mentioned. He also wrote commentaries to the Pentateuch or the five books, to Joshua, to Judges, and possibly other books. So if he's writing all this commentary, all these works in Hebrew, did he not write the book of Daniel? But they can't say that because this Daniel El Kuhn is happening even after the 6th century. <laughs> he's popping off way over here in like the 900s or something like that. Man. There we go, 946. Uh-oh. So they got to say, yeah, he, he wrote, you know, his own code. You know, he, he did compile a code. They can't say he compiled the code that he wrote his own book because they can't make that dating so late. Because then if Daniel's popping off in 1,000 or 900, when does Jesus take place? I'll wait. There's no room for JC no more. You got to push Daniel to the BCs.
But if Daniel's really happening in the ADs and 1100s and 1200s, like I'm, I'm feeling 1200 vibe, you know, 1100. Some might even say 1600s, man. Where's your JC? We know where Joshua was popping off on, you know. <laughs> we know where our Joshua was at, but where's your Joshua fit in? Y'all can't even play with chronology because your Yahweh Shai gets the X name right away because you don't have room for it. If Joshua is Quetzalcoatl, and the Mormons know this, leading his Nagas to the promised land, the rainbow covenant, rainbow dragon, and he's popping off in 1100s or 10 something. Where does your Jesus come in at? Well, he's supposed to be year one. That means your JC must be popping off way, what, 1800s? <laughs> to Kum say, like, your story, all that stuff, it's no room for it. It's just a phantom. Like, it, like Josephus is really, you know, I mean, go get that Caesar's Messiah. Love to Yosef the real for the great completion of that work. And Ahab to the Hakan. You know what I'm saying? For light and spark. A out to all my noggers that contributed to the Preston investigation. A D the truth seer, truth seeker, A out to A D. You know what I'm saying? A lot of links coming towards the Preston flow. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, Jay Stu and the crew, what it do? You know what I'm saying? All my noggers, man. Drop Nation, we way up. So da Daniel wrote the code. Just like Moses' mama needs. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's go. Daniel Alcum, now spelled with a Q, right? Under the leadership of Daniel Alcum, a carry, Kara, settlement, prospered in the Holy Land, from which it spread as far as Northwest Africa. Whoa. Hold up, man. Where's Northwest Africa again, man? Hold up, man. Where's my Northwest Africa connection, man? <laughs> my bad. I'm just getting so lakey around here, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're about to be in this book of jazz, share. Talking about this Moshe flow, man. I'm just having fun. I got more links up than I've ever had, ever. You know what I'm saying? But we had to bring it on home, and we couldn't hold no punches, man. Couldn't pull back no no stops on these hijacks, man. Oh, yeah, we got some Shambhala. Okay, 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 okay. Northwest Africa, got it. So Daniel's influence, it said, spread all the way to North. West Africa, but how would you know you in Northwest Africa? Because that's a big secret. It's a hush hush about the Moors. That's like a big secret. Truth is, the Moors were uh, the indigenous inhabitants. Uh, depends on how you really see in this Morocco flow. We know that you are the seeds of Shem, and if these are the lands of Shem, then certainly you would have a lot in the lands of Shem, but you wanted a lot. You wanted everything for the Pharaoh, for Ham and Cush, and them, for Atlantis, for Atlas. Plural of Atlas is Atlantis. Atlas is who? Their first Khan. This is their first priest king. The first priest king of Atlantis they worship Atlas, man. <laughs> Ham and Kush. Ham and Kush. With permission of, the, permission of the Pharaoh, they migrate. Okay. All right. So, when we talking Daniel, El Kul Misi, this Kari, this this Karakatai flow, just like in the book of Daniel, this royal sea without a blemish raised up as an exilar in hostile territory. Tribes them up. 
you know, really because of his faith in the creator gains peace and shalom for a lot of the Hebrews at that time under Daniel, you know. These Nagas prospered in the Holy Land. From which it spread as far as Northwest Africa and Christian Spain. Where's Northwest Africa? <laughs> a barrage of carrier treatises pre presenting new views of scriptural exegesis stimulated renewal study of the Bible and the Hebrew language. Northwest Africa, man, always coming back home. Daniel El Kumisi. Kiliab, second son of Dawi, perfection of the father, perfection of Dawi. Without a blemish, who died without sin, one of four sinless knockers. What was his relationship with Anand ben David, right? So this is what we've been digging on. Because Anand ben David also wrote the code <laughs> in 770. We're talking Aniyah. Anand wrote the definitive code of his order, Sefer Hamas Woe. So they both wrote the Sefer Hamas Woe, right? Daniel wrote his Sefer Hamas Woe. Legal code. Sefer Hamas Woe, Book of Commandments, right? So he wrote his code. Got it. Anand ben David, son of David. <laughs> right? So if they're putting Daniel around 900, he's talking about 8th century. So now we're in the 700s, but it's all relative with chronology, man. So he writes his code, Sefer Hamas Woe, Book of precepts <laughs> its unifying principle is its rejection of much of the Talmud so he wasn't with that Judaism not a not not any of and of the rabbinate so he wasn't with their their priests <laughs> their Jewish convert priests he wasn't with that which based its authority on the Talmud Only the Bible is held to be valid, or the Torah or Tanakh, but it is interpreted with an unusual mixture of freedom and literalism. After Anand's death, his followers settled in Jerusalem. Eventually, his movement developed into the order known as Karaism, and that's why they said Daniel is pushing his own Karaism. Kariot Judaism, they call it. He urged his fellow Kariites or Israelites or Kar like Karakatai under the Prestigeon, like the Cathay Nagas, the Black Cathayans, rejecting the Talmud, rejecting their their rabbis whose authority is with the Tamu developed into an order known as Kariism, which also was a aesthetically as aesthetically oriented and rejected Talmudic Talmudic authority. When the state of Israel, <laughs> we just talked about the state of Israel was founded in 1948. Several thousand Kariites settled there. Kariites in 1948 are not the Kariites of uh, the eighth century. You know what I'm saying? They just had the title Kariites, man. So we're talking a brotherhood. We're talking as a large. We're talking an internal situation between brothers. Again, we see Anam and David popping up, you know, in the genie. They give him the date 715. Iran or Persia, right? But which one? 
No. Will they say he's the son of David? Will they say he's the son of Yehudai? <laughs> Ain't that Judah? You know? Okay. Son of Marzakai. You know, we could have fun with this, man, as we like, as we like to do. So, Yehuda, or the Jedi, <laughs> son of Marzakai, right, who's also Yehuda. Who's the son of Naaman? Oh boy, Ben Rabbi Moroni. Stop. Did we just find Moroni? Did we just find pretty Tony Moroni <laughs> in the lineage of a non Ben David? Hold up, man. This is getting too good for getting way too good in Preston One. I know. Maroney, man. Like Maroney, man. <laughs> Body bad. <laughs> I don't know, man. <clears throat> could be something, could be nothing, but there is this Book of More, man. And Maroney, I think, is what the son of Mormon. And Captain Maroney is this important Nephite military commander who lived during the first century BC. And we're just tracking the ancestors of uh, Anand ben David, which must mean they connect to the same press to flow. I don't know much about this prophet Maroney. <laughs> Last Nephite prophet, huh? Last Nephite prophet. According to the Book of Mormon, the Nephites are one of four groups to have settled in the ancient Americas. Okay, we're just talking indigenous Naga prophets. Stop it. Historian, military commander who lived in the Americas. That's what I love about this Mormon drive. They bring it right home, don't they? They bring it right home. Can we just talk to Maroney, David, the Swan Knights, Preston John, Septimania, Kaleloos. So Maroney popping off right out the Americas, they say the late fourth and early fifth centuries. Hold up. But the Captain Maroney, they put him in the first century, right? <laughs> then they say the Captain Maroney shares the name with the Prophet Maroney, the former is indexed in the LDS edition of the Book of Mormon as Maroney. So Maroney's called Maroney, and then you got a Captain Maroney. The last Nephite military, it looks like we caught him, we caught him in another time shift. Is Captain Maroney Maroney? Right? But now the Maroney prophet is now being put in the fifth century. <laughs> and then Daniel, he's over there in the sixth century, right? Or Belshazzar, or Kilian, son of David. And how does this Moroni flow got to do with David? I'm talking name it. Mar, Rabbi, Rabbi, Arab, <laughs> Rabbi, a Rabbi. <laughs> Morona. <laughs> Tara. Zancta. Wow. Meronia. Meron. Meronia. Merona. Guarding the gateway. Tarzan. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Let's take it real slow for press the one. Hello.
So what are they talking? Eighth century, fourth century, fifth century. Where they put Caleb at? Killy. They don't put him nowhere. Huh? <laughs> they say, hey, man, you guess, man. Your guess is our guess. later known as the Angel Moroni or the Dragon, who presented the golden plates to Joseph Smith, who translated the plates upon which the Book of Mormon was written. So everything popped off with Moroni, man. Everything popped off with Moroni, man. Who's Moroni, man? Who's the Tenderoni Moroni, man? <laughs> yeah, man. So... Naaman Mar Rabbi Moroni Ben Hananiah. I see an Antion flow coming in, coming in high. Jayon. Hey Templar, what's Jayon? Oh, got it. You just mean John. Jayon, Jayon is John. John of Pombetta. <laughs> He's circa 719. And he's the son of Hananiah, son of Bustani, Bustani. Right, we're just digging in the timelines, man. And he's the son of another Hananiah, or uh, excuse me, Anna. Ania. Exilarch and John of Pumbedetta. <laughs> so these are Johns, which means King, Exilarchs, Anan, let's go. Who's also the son of another Anan. Oh man, I think we found all the Anans, right? With all these Anans going up and us talking about Anan Ben David, are we seeing clearly? Are we seeing clearly that in the line of Anand and David are all these Anand, 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 and we still just talking Anion? Anand, I said, we still talking Anion. Anion. <laughs> Anion, Anand. Change later to Arnon. They dropped the regnum because they took your kingdom. Covera, Kiber, Eber, let's go. It's pressed to one hano. So Anan's descendants are more Anans or Hananiah. Hanan <laughs> of Iskia. Let's go. 33rd XLR. Wow, the son of another Hananiah, Anan, 32nd XLR. I'm in the 500s now. And the son of another Ananiah, Anunayah, 31st XLR, Huna. You see that star? <laughs> This is before the Jewish conversion, man. So anything with that star on it, that Dawi on it, that Merkaba flow in the 400s can't be talking about them or not. Wow. He's the husband of Hava, which can also be called Hawa. Like Eve is also named Hava or Kawa or Hawa after life, which is your breath. <sighs> wow, insecurity. So they named after the frequency of Hawa, Hava, Havilia, Hava. 
regent and heir of Marhuna the fourth. They're putting them all in Babylon, right? Nah, man. Not when we know that Babylon's over here, according to a maxim in there. Wow, so these are Hebrews. They're carrying the frequency, the Hava, Hawa, Kawa, Eve frequency, Hawa, creator frequency. More Hananias, son of Mar, Mar, Ben, Mar, Zuch. Okay. Now he's Zutra the first, son of Zutra the pious, or Ka Hana, <laughs> another Ana coming in high. Another son of Kahana, Ben Abba Mari, or Mori, or Mori, Amari. Let's go. Son of Abba Mari. Hey, I like this one. They got, they got a lot in here, man. It's also named, <laughs> known as Shalom. All right. <clears throat> so they try to put him on some Persian flow. He's still Shalom. He's still Shalawan. <laughs> son of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, Nehemiah, who's the son of another Nehemiah, Ben Nathan, who's the son of Nathan. <laughs> All right, so back to the Hanan flow. Son of Anani or Ania. So as much as the David flow is repeated, this Ania. I went back to 190 AD. Then you got another Nathan. Who's the son of the second exilarch of Judah. Let me how far back you want to go that we're going to keep running into you. And this is before no conversion of no converts to Judaism. And uh, Never seen so much Hananias and Aninias and Anans. Ben Dawi. So we're bringing the story together of what Daniel L. Kuhn, you know, was kind of going toe to toe with his own bro, Anna, who comes from a whole line of Anans. So all those Anans are also connected with Daniel's flow as well. Kumisi or Kilian. Perfection of the Father. Let's go. Let go. Yeah. Garcia was very familiar with Bo Zaltieri's map and Maldonado's description of the straits. He referenced both of them in his narrative. Perhaps he also was attracted by the comment on the rapid tides that governed them, which may have struck him as a possible allusion to the river San Benya. The sabbatical rivers that the river that flowed six days and rested every Shabbat. Mythical, right? Using Ortelius's map, which places Azareth on the Asian side of the Straits, he was able to come up with a plausible trajectory leading the 10 tribes all the way to Mexico or New Spain. The path he proposes also explains some of the American Indians' rights and customs on their way from Azareth to the kingdom of Ania, the 10 tribes he asserts picked up the customs and the rights observed in that kingdom and province, careful 
to provide a complete picture of the possible paths to America, Garcia also discusses the Greenland routes, providing a review of several suggestions put forth by other scholars, among them Gennebrard, Gennebrard, G-E-N-E-B-R-A-R-D, who, quote, maintains that Azareth is in Grand Tartaria, that, as it is said in Edris, it is across the river Euphrates. The ten tribes went to the desert of Tartary and from there to that land towards the island of Greenland. So Greenland plays heavy because in that part it said it is said that America is not surrounded by sea and in other parts it is enclosed by the sea and is almost an island. Thus we have at least three paths the ten tribes could have taken to America. Drum roll please. <laughs> Atlantis the Straits of Ania and Greenland. Garcia's argumentation is an illustration of the various exercises in global geography that the 10 tribes triggered. They involved early modern geography as well as scripture as one sought to establish the existence of the 10 tribes in America, one had to deal with the question of their route there, simply saying that God or an angel or Jesus <laughs> performed some miracles and route was not enough. With the existence of accurate maps and a growing scientific ge geographic culture, one had to stretch the trajectory as clear as possible as geographical knowledge of the world expanded and was recorded on increasingly accurate maps, the exercise had to make geographical sense. They just can't say that you're from here. You, they have to find your path, right? <laughs> this mode of augmentation peaked in 1681 with Diego Andres Roca, a physician from Lima, who had served in different capacities in Spanish America, Roca's lengthy Tratudo Unico y Singular de Origen de, na, de los Indios is indeed unique and singular, covering all peoples from Santa Fe in the north through Mexico, Peru, Chile, Roca, an ardent Spanish patriot, as his 19th century editor dubbed him, makes the argument that the Americans' ancestors were descendants of ancient inhabitants of Spain and in the first place, and of the Israelites and the Tartars in the second. Descendants of the ancient inhabitants of Spain is only saying that as original and aboriginal as they get in Spain, there's a connection between them and the Americas. Not that they came from Spain, but that these descendants of ancient Spain are also connected with these American ancestors. Because these descendants of ancient Spain came from America. My God. These Israelites, these Tartars. Roca's problem was how to explain differences among the Native Americans. I mean, that's our problem too, to this day particularly differences that made some very valiant while others were not. So some were valiant Nagas and some were not, different tribes. His solution was simple. The valiant Native Americans were descendants of the ancient Iberians. The others were either Tartars or Israelites, damn. So he's trying to put his Spanish twist on this thing. Man. They came from Spain, they're valiant. If not, they must be descendant of the Israelites. But what you need to get out of this, getting the babies out the bathwater while they talk their shit <laughs> about us, is that these Israelites and these Tartars are the Native Americans. Body bag. Are they going to cut? Y'all going to cut me off here, man? Y'all been cutting us off a lot lately, man. I don't think we appreciate all, the, all this cutoffness we getting out of y'all, man. Not cool, man. Not cool. 
I've been trying to dig on stuff. They keep cutting us off, man. I tried to go back to these Kalalu's links we just got about two drops ago. Look at it now, man. Sorry. Sorry, boss. The page you're looking for in this blog does not exist. I try reloading, reloading. You know, maybe you'll come back up, man. But then I tried another Kalalu's link off the same blog. And sorry, sorry, boss. This page you're looking for does not exist. So that's why we've been PDFing and putting this on flash drives, you know, ether packs and press the packs, man, and all that because we got to preserve this drop because they are removing it. And I don't even like dropping links no more. I'm going to do it one more time for Preston 100. But other than that, you got to come in our own secluded alcove to get these links at 432thedrop.com. Other than that, they're going to keep taking them down. So we got to protect it. Not cool, boss. Not cool. I mean, look, it's all good. We talking Ania, right? So we got a good piece. Uh, you know, we, we browse a little bit in this book called The Lost Kingdom of Ania. Got some great maps in it and all that, man. Let's see if we can. There we go. So they, they want to find the light of the knowledge of the Anion kingdom. They want to pretty much bring this into this um, this British Columbia flow, which is all, you know, relative. It's all, can, you know, Canadian, you know, Canada, Canada, you know what I mean? They go into some of this conquistador flow. Let's get right to the Right to the golden flowers over here, man. <laughs> Juan de Fuco, 1536 to 1602. The next Spaniard to venture up the northwest coast of America in search of the Strait of Anya was Juan de Fuco, 1592, 13 years after Drake and 49 years after Cabrillo, even though scholars today debate whether or not Fuco even existed. Most historians agree that he was never near what was then the Strait of Ania. Fictitious or not, Juan de Fuco is the most important character in the story of the lost kingdom of Ania Regnum. Okay, so they're going to go Heavy in the Fuco drop. Heavy in the Fuco drop. Born Ionis Focas in 1536 on the Ionian islands of Cafalonia, Greece. Little was known of Juan de Fuco early, early life until he came under the service of King Philip of Spain in 1555. Even though there were no records of him in the Spanish archives, Ionis Focas <laughs> was said to have been the pilot of the Spanish Navy in the West Indies. And by pilot, they might be referring to ship captain, also called pilots, I guess. But what else are we talking about? A position he was supposed to have held for 40 years, Fuca, would have known Sir Francis Drake, the dragon. Whoa. So why they calling Francis Drake the dragon, man? I mean, we know they're looking for the gold. Sir Francis Drake in succession up the northwest coast came Sir Francis Drake, an English sea captain who was born in commoner, a commoner in 1540. He became known for being a failed slave trader when he was still in his 20s. His first attempt at selling slaves across the Atlantic ended in the loss of money and freed slaves. 
His second attempted attempt with slave trading ended in war with the Spanish, starting with the Battle of San Juan de Ulu, Ulu, Ulua in 1568. The English lost, and Drake barely escaped with his life, vowing revenge on the Spanish. How much you want to bet all these is Nagas, man? And they called him the dragon, too. Drake's career started 1572 at the age of 32 when he gained command of two small sailing vessels with a crew of 73 men. For a year, he raided Spanish settlements, slaughtering every Spanish he found on the Panama Peninsula, early or earning the reputation of pirate from the Spanish and dubbed the Dragon. <laughs> It was during this time, we are told, Drake climbed a tree to be the first Englishman to see the Pacific Ocean. And now you live in California, you go to Venice Beach, you know, you always see it, but they, they were fighting to be the first to see this Pacific Ocean. What's inside the Pacific Ocean? <laughs> I heard you can't even fly over the Pacific Ocean like that, man. He held the Spanish Pacific coast of South, of South and Central America in terror. The dragon was coming to kill them. The hold of the golden hind quickly filled with gold and silver. So they're afraid of the dragon. <laughs> That's what you need to know. You're back to this Fuka business, man. Whatever the case, whether or not Juan de Fuca lived, the fact remains. In 1787, Charles William Barclay said he rediscovered the lost strait. He changed the name of the strait from the Anion Strait to the Juan de Fuca Strait, re relegating Anion Regnum to lost history. So that's when it's no longer called Anion Kingdom no more. You don't, you don't see. Remember Hosea 3, you, you've been in solitary many days without a king. That also means you've been in solitary many days without a kingdom. That also means that you don't know your last noble image. You don't know what your kingdom is. You don't know who you are. The name of Israel is no longer remembered. We've been cut off from being a nation. Proverbs or Psalms 83. So now they call it the Fuka de, the Fuka Strait. No longer Anon. All that history we just got from Anon and the lineage of Anon and Anion and, and Hananine and all that stuff, all that Anion Hanan flow. Even Presta got a son named Hanan, Anion. <laughs> all that Anion flow. Well, of course, you know, we got Anon Ben David. So we know that, amen. And this is how they change history. This is how they change history. Ain't that something? Ain't it something, man? David Sauslin, right? One hundred. So if you dig on David Sauce, it's gonna take you to multiple ones. But what I'm focusing right here about this Hanan business right quick is that the Exilarch David is the brother of Solomon and Hanan. Hanan is also the son of Raja Hiraja Chola II, Jadaran or Prester John. Here he, he's listed as the father of Solomon, Hanan, and David. But it don't say who his father is, but you just see that this Hanan flow 
is continuing even in 1200s. We got this Antion flow popping off. Anna, Antion. Got you, boss. Got you. You can dig on. Uh, ooh. <laughs> hey, press the one on one coming in hot, man. <laughs> like I said, reaching 100 is like reaching one. And one on one is two, right? One plus one. So here we go. Sauceland, David Bragg Tony. So this is going to bring you clear, clearer into the Georgian dynasties because as you keep hearing about this, Voynich manuscript being this Hebreo Georgian flow, right? This press the flow they wanted to connect it with a Hebreo Georgian, right? The so called Voynich manuscript is a 15th century copy of the original, which, which was written by him in the 12th century. Who? The first Prester John, Emperor. Of the three Indias, the Voynich wasn't written in the 15th century, but the 12th century, they say. The language is a Hebrew, <laughs> Georgian, Indian language of the royal house. That's so encrypted that MIT, Yale University, and none of their top cryptographers and top computer software programs, cracking code program, nobody can crack the code of this Hebrew. This Preston. But what's this Georgian about? What's the Hebrew, Hebreo Georgian all about? The Bragan. Bagrationis. <laughs> so now you can do the same thing as we did with the Anon, as we've been doing, you know what I'm saying, with these titles in general, and start to connect the Bragg Tony, King of Georgian flow, and know you're talking Israel, know you're talking Israel, because even George, you know what I'm saying, all these names are originally Israelite kings, even before the hijack Georges, and the hijack, you know, uh, you know, all these things are hijacking, you know what I'm saying, from these titles. So the Bagrationis, they say, wow, whoa, whoa, whoa. So this David Sauslin, <laughs> they're putting him at 1700s. Uh oh. Son of Eric, King of Georgia. Who's the son of Tamara, Tamaraz, king of Ka, Kati, or Kartli, and Tamara. Damn, we got back in, then I say every time we look, we keep running into Queen Tamara, man. But now you got a much recent version of Queen Tamara. See the previous David Sauslins, man? The one we normally dig on. Remember the chronological time shift, 300 years, 1,000, you know what I mean? So they pushed in about 400 years difference. Who's his wife? Oh, they don't even list it. Oh, okay. Or who's Solomon's wife, should I say? Husband of Labadi, Labana, Lebna. Gadi, Rabadi, Gadi, Mani, Ka, Ka. Who's Hanan's wife? Interesting. So they're hiding the tomorrow flow on this link. They don't even list the wife of this David. But he's the father of Hasdai. And notice they don't even list Hasdai's mother. They don't want you to, they don't want you to connect the David Tamar flow right here. What about this David Sausland? <laughs> All they tell you is he's the son of Jadaran, right? Which we know Jadaran, Preston John, that's been confirmed on this flow. 
David, son of Jadarah. Okay. <laughs> but they just say son of Jad of Jadaron of of Alania of Ru oh man. So now you know Jadaron of Alania is Prester John, Raja Haraja Chola, also of Alania. So they give you another title to connect to ancient Israel. And he's the husband of Rusadan. Before they said Lady Hannah. Which lets us know <laughs> that Rusadan is Lady Hannah. Mother of David Salsla. Sister of Dimitri the First, King of Georgia. So here's where these Georgians come in, Managa. So this is why on the Voynich manuscript, it's Hebrew Georgian, Indian, right? So then you pull in the Raja Hiraja Cholas and all that. You got this Indian flow. The Georgians, you got this Bragatoni flow. The Hebrew, you got these Davids and Solomons. You put them all together, you got the royal house being split apart in all their historiography. <laughs> the way they want to tell the story, they just take a piece here, take a piece here, take a piece here. You put the Hebrew, Hebrew <laughs> back with this Georgian, which, you know, is Russia, but is also, you know, right here. You know what I'm saying? This India which is also right here, India Superior. We're talking the royal house of Israel. The Rus, the An Rus, right? Let's go back. It's crazy how they be hiding the Queen Tamar flow and then she just pop out <laughs> when we ain't even looking for her. Uh oh. So four different profiles of the same person, different different time periods. This one links it pretty much where I think it would be at in this 12th century. And instead of saying that they don't know who his wife is, now they let you know, husband of Tamar, right? <laughs> Tamar Bagrantioni, also known as Holy Righteous King Tamar, whoa, because she had to take the wheel. Now, when did she take the wheel? Was it after he died when Genghis Khan invaded Preston John, his daddy, in 1202? And according to the story, A. David died. Was it the Prester or was it his son? And if it was his son, that describes or explains why Queen Tamar is called King Tamar. Because our queens and kings, they <laughs> they rule together. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like it just went into somebody's hands. She takes the wheel. She's the high Amazon queen. She becomes king. Khan. Khan tomorrow. You better get it right. I'm talking Khan tomorrow. And she gives birth to more lady dragons. Rusadan of Georgia and all that. So now we found clearly that David's wife is Queen Tamar or Khan Tamar. <laughs> but in this link, they didn't tell you that, right? He's just the son of Jadaron Preston. They didn't tell you about the mama. Nah, over here they tell you. Exilar David, they don't even tell you his wife. They keep saying Lady Hannah is his mama, which we just got as Lady Ruth, Dan Ruth, Lady Ruth. Or Hannah is also Anna, like Anna. Khan. So we did all that just to confirm the Tamar flow. Why? Because in this link, David Sauslin is now being put in 1700s. <laughs> Son of Eric, King of Georgia, all this stuff, Queen Consort of Carly. Half brother of Va Tong the Good, okay. Rusadan Bragantini, the Mar Bragantoni of Georgia. <laughs> it's 
So this one lists her as half or half sister. Mm. Tamar Bragantoni now being put in 1740. So we went from 1100s to the 1700s. And she's the wife of David. <laughs> but this time they call him David the General Orbelian. All right, man. So, oh, husband of tomorrow. Wait, son of a husband of tomorrow. Right, 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 right. Okay. Okay. Let's get back. I'm just on my tomorrow flow. I'm just on my tomorrow flow. That's very interesting, man. Sometimes they talk about it, sometimes they don't. So back to Lost Kingdom of Anion Regnum, it is at the moment in history that our narrative of the Lost Kingdom of Anion Regnum takes a turn in that for close to 200 years after Juan de Fuca, no one attempted to enter British Columbia. Wow, so it, it was almost like a safe haven for Nagas because no one went over there. And Sebastian Visciano's expedition was the last one even to Oregon before the expiration of the Pacific Northwest coast of British Columbia. Canada even startled it was over. <laughs> Canada even started. It was over. All right. Perhaps the maps of the 1600s into the 1700s may shine some light on the mystery of why British Columbia remained untouched for so long while the rest of America was being raped and pillaged by its European conquerors and the eastern cities were beginning to thrive. Author R. Ropes continues about the maps on page 19 in, quote, early exploration of America of the English history review that, quote, the void thus left was filled up by the more or less ingenious conjectures of map makers and cosmographers. Some of their minor delusions, so great is the power of printing error, lasted longer than one could expect and showed in some cases a singular power of resurrection. In other words, <laughs> they missing on the map. So maybe somebody was looking out for them like, hey, don't even put this part of the map. But this whole part of the map is missing. <laughs> or do they not want you to know that this is Asia and that they couldn't really connect all the rest of it because that'll give it away that this is really Asia, India Superior, man. You tell me, man. So great book, you know. I love the cartography in this joint right here. Kind of details a lot of these conquistadors and these expeditions. Yeah, you know I mean, how they started discovering this BC territory more and more goes into Captain James Cook, which I compare to Captain James T. Kirk of the Star Trek Enterprise. What do you think? Is James Kirk a reflection of James Cook or Captain Hook? <laughs> And it's Peter Pan, just pressed the John. <laughs> That's good. And I would have known extensively about the Antion Strait, the kingdom of Antion. Who's talking? Cook would have thought he was the only European to ever sail along the unexplored coastline. And I would think he would have known extensively about the Strait of Antion. Cook was ordered explicitly to avoid any contact with Spain, who we are told were still in control of the coast and had guarded it against any intrusion for 200 years. Cook sailed past the Antion Strait, but because he didn't see it with his own eyes, declared it wasn't there. So he got close, man, he got close. Went right by it, man. Yeah. Then you got James Charles Stewart and Charles William Barclay. Other explorers came after Barclay, like Captain George Vancouver, which is named after today, 1792, of whom 
half of BC is named after and whose gold stature or statue stands on top of the BC Parliament building. But the search for the elusive Strait of Anion, now called the Juan de Fuca Strait, was over, and Anion Regnum all but lost to history. The kingdom of Anion was no longer spoken seriously about in historical circles. Historical circles only whispered in myths like Atlantis. We've been relegated to a myth, Managa. You've been relegated to a myth. Dragon's mythology, Preston mythology, Anion mythology. Even, even, you know, biblical times are now just mythology, right? It is now completely forgotten in time like Quivera, like Canubus, Norumbega, and Bird. Other lost unknown places in North America shown in detail on old maps, almost completely erased from historical narrative except on the old maps. And in old history books written over a hundred years ago, <laughs> these lost places are not even considered a possibility today. The rumors of seven cities of gold persisted down through the ages, however. So there's one final written reference to Anion Regnum within recorded history, which is connected to the earliest gold rushes, man. California, right? In British Columbia during the middle to late 1800s in the time when cities all around the world like late Victoria, BC were being constructed from red brick. Quote, the presence of gold in what is now British Columbia is spoken of in many old legends that in part led to his discovery. The Strait of Anion claimed to have been sailed by Juan de Fuca, for whom the strait is named after today, was described as passing through the land, a land, Anion, rich in gold, silver, pearls, fur, like the explorers of old searching for the Strait of Anion. The gold seekers, the gold seekers came hunting for the gold and for the lost kingdom of Anion Regnum. So that's why it's going to be compared to Atlantis and all that is you find Anion, you found Atlantis, you found the gold, you found the land of the press, the Kavera, Eber, you found everything, Kalelus, you found it all, boss. You found it all. Yeah. They want to talk about the turtle people. Okay, okay. <laughs> hey, all right. Some Alaska drops. So get the drop. We're digging on it, man. Having a good time. Surfing the wave, man. And you've been allowing this to be as amazing as it is, man. You've been continuing the flow. Like my bro B O W Drop Nation. Hawa. While listening about the unbreakable code, I was reminded of World War II. The Navajo Indian language was used to avoid detection of plans to attack the enemy. The code was called unbreakable. It could be something or it could be nothing. <laughs> wow, hey, bro. Well, we do know that it was definitely, you know, made so secretive because we needed it for military reasons as well as to hide our things and to keep our history and, you know, whatever other secrets. But unbreakable code could they have been writing in the same hebrew <laughs> hebreo uh indian george you know what i'm saying hello leona popping off on the early documents such as census or marriage and other so-called contracts so-called indians would sign with a mark and pow and x whoa my sister popping way off she connecting the dots man hey i sis Sam Miles, what you talking about, man? He says, man, I missed a lot in these trying to catch up. But thank you, brother, for all your hard work. Don't trip on missing nothing. Just enjoy that we got something. Enjoy that we've been surfing away together and that we got it right here. Documented, our documented, published investigation on YouTube. They can steal it, but they can't ever duplicate it. They can steal from it. 
but they can't duplicate it. They can write their books about what we drop in almost verbatim as we are saying it, but they cannot duplicate the water. They got to go on their own investigation to get the Preston 100. We ain't in the back of no one else's classroom over here in Drop Nation. We're simply surfing away. Allow why? M-H-O-E. <laughs> and we still got that fire burn. Okay. All right. Long as we got that fire burning for the Preston. We talking the Rusa dance, which means we talking the Ann Rus. We been talking the Rus. If you talking Russia, if you talking Asia there, or Asia here, the Saracens, the Papu Boo Doom Diverses, they came against these Nagas. They came against Israel. The lost tribes of Hashira. In real time. Who or who is Preston John? <laughs> Legendary patriarch that they call Christian or Nestorian. Nestor, old king renowned for wise counsel. The location of the Preston's kingdom is said to be in Central Asia or India or Anya. Get the drive, man. Catch up on what they're saying about the Preston. 14th century Africa talking about the Preston. <laughs> yeah. They all need the title. They got their own Preston flow, you know. To them, it's Haile Selassie and he's this, he's the God, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he's the God, man. He's the prophet. You no, know what I mean? Marcus Garvey's the prophet, but I mean, come on, man. We've gone a long time without nobility. We replaced our nobility. You replaced the original Preston. Ethiopia has been claimed for many years as the origin of the Preston John legend, but many experts believe it is simply adapted to fit that nation in the same fashion. It was projected onto Mongolia and India in the 13th century. There is nothing about Preston or his country that would make Ethiopia a more suitable identification than any other place. And there was no knowledge of this story in the Ethiopian hinterland before European contact. <sighs> because they're in the wrong Ethiopia and they're in the wrong India. Kan Kan. Kan Kan. Medieval Empire of the Israelites by Robert Grisham. Bitch belly flopping on page 297 of the PDF. 286 of the actual book. The coming to power of a Semitic group in Rome signified a transition to an Aramaic Hebrew. Aramaic Hebrew language. And this strengthened the positions of the Semitic regions in weakened Latin Europe. Here is why the traditional history believes that the dark time of the all European decay arrived. It is also called a huge, a time of huge influence of Eastern and Arabic cultures. Supposedly the Arabs gave Europe mathematics Right? Yeah. Ask the Moors, they're going to break it down. Yeah, we, we schooled all the so-called whites. <laughs> and then we created your opposites. And we put them against you because we're the alchemical serpent. We represent androgyny. We bring everything to life and kill everything. Astronomy, medicine, everything is correct. But only... Not Arabs, but Aramaic, Semitic group. It was not divided in a practical way into Hebrew and Arabic. All the way to the end of the 15th century, the Israelites prayed in Hebrew in temples with minarets, minarets, M-I-N-A-R-E-T-S, and wrote prayers in Arabic and Hebrew. 
Remember Arab proper, Joktan flow. The root of the word Arab is Rav or what? Rav like a, a rabbi, right? So the Hebrew rabbi is the a rab. <laughs> Got him. Got him, boss. At the beginning is the Hebrew attributive term. So you can't get, whoa. <laughs> Yo, I promise, man, I, I'm belly flopping. And we been dick. Go get the previous drops, man. I did not see, but this is more validation. Press the one, huh? Oh, let's go for the dismount. Arab is Rav, R-A-V. Okay. The word rabbi originated from the root Rav, right? You see that? You see that, man? So when we talk Arab proper, yeah. When we talk in Joktan and Arab proper and stuff, son of Eber, his, he's also called Kata in Arabic literature with a K, first king of Yemen, right? This is son of Eber. Hebrew, first king of Yemen. His son, Yarub, first person to speak Arabic. This is why they're praying in Arabic, because it's coming from Yarub. It's coming from Katan, Kar Katan. Kata, right? Kathay, right? Choctaw, right? <laughs> this is why Takunse wanted to tribe you up, because we are all Katan. You got to know there's a difference. This is but the legendary form of the tradition that Catan was the progenitor of the Southern Arabs. Joktan, which is also Yucatan, or Arabs proper, while Ishmaelite Arabs were not of Arab stock, were originally of non-Arab stock. Just because they came from Abraham don't make you an A rabbi. Don't make you a rabbi. Just because you came from Ishmael don't make you a rabbi in code with the tribe of Israel. Just because you coming out of Ishmael or Moab or anything else don't make you a rabbi. It makes you a musty, a musty rat. <laughs> That's what they call it. We're talking about pretending Arabs. Adopting Arab customs, adopting a rabbi custom, adopting the code and spinning it and twisting it, fusing it with pagan worship. Now, the original Arabs were Qatar. The original Arabs were the proper of Eber. We're talking Sheba, man. We're talking Ofer, man. And we still got to have a whole section digging on Ofer and, you know, all these possibilities and places it can be. I guess one-on-one, -on -one, we're coming in hot. <laughs> like I said, we just getting started. You know, and look for us to pick it up exclusively at 432thedrop.com. We've given YouTube enough, man. All right, all y'all need to know is that Joktan is the father of Ophir and that you can't have no Christ of Ophir, Christopher. You can't be no anointed of Ophir if you ain't of Eber. Eberu. And even being a... Uh, of Abraham and any of that other stuff. If you ain't in code, you ain't the proper. You ain't the proper heir. You pretending heir, not proper heir. Because rabbi originated from Rav. Arab is Rav. The root Rav, the root of the word Arab is Rav. So you're getting a ra from the Hebrew attributive term, which is in rabbi, like biblical Reuben and many 
other ideas, man. Yeah. I like this belly flop right here, man. You know, I love talking about the con of cons. The con of cons. Yeah, Qumran was not Christian. <laughs> let's let's get that clear. The Qumran scrolls have nothing to do with Christianity. It has everything to do with the Qum. El Qum, Daniel El Qum. <laughs> For the dismount, my knock. We having too much fun, man. Got everything to do with Daniel, right? El Kumisi, huh? El Kumisi. Connects with the Kumran. Who's writing the code? They done talked about Jeremiah already. They done brought us into the Vatican, Vatican, House of Khan, Khan Father, Great Khan. Preston John's kingdom is named the Empire of the Great Khan. So when Marco Polo's over here, looking for the great Khan, you know he's looking for the press or whoever got the title. The main conclusion is the idea of the grail is the idea of imperial power, imperial power, or we're just talking about the, you know, I guess, yeah, the rulership of the kingdom of Prester John is the grail. It did. Because Prester John was the master of a huge empire, omnipotent, all-powerful, King of the Tsars, like K Tsars, like Ka Ka Tsars, Ka, like Kara, were for him only subjects. So all the lower kings were subjects in the house of the press. The Tracticus Polymacher, Polymachermus calls John the King of Kings, the Rex Naga, the Rex Ragnum like the Anion Regnum, like the Kuvera Eva Regnum, Khan of Khans. He combines in himself spiritual authority and their earthly, secular, worldly authority. And he can say about himself, I, Preston John, by Hawa's grace, Lord of all lords who only are beneath the heaven. I'm the king of kings, the kind of cons only beneath Hawa from the rising of the sun to paradise on earth. Preston John controls and holds back the tribes of Gog and Magog. They're still celebrating these giants in Europe today and controls the seen and the unseen worlds, man. But now you got some other all powerful. You got some Jesus. He's now controlling the seen and unseen world. I don't think so. He ain't got the keys to see. He ain't the dragon. He came to slay the dragon. Presta sees the unseen. Presta sees the unseen. And anybody that want to be a king or a con, Alexander the Great, Xerxes the Persian king, Ogier, we're talking about giants, Ogier the Dane. <laughs> They all had to visit the kingdom of the Preston John, where they were accorded legitimization, legit, legitimatization, <laughs> legitimatization. That's a seven syllable word to get legit, <laughs> to be too legit. They had to come see the con of cons. They had to come to the emperor of the great con, the godfather. Nah. The Khan <laughs> the Vatican, which they changed to Vatican once it was hijacked. Khan. Also, there is towards the south, 
back in Preston John Legend and his sources for the dismount for the cons for Preston John one. Hello. Page 84, the PDF. Hey, how about what type is that? Also, there is towards the south in that region a certain place of ours at which the world ends. We're talking what? Antarctica, Australia's Tarazanta. Are we talking Tarazanta? Wow. <laughs> what is Moroni? Oh, man, got to do with this Antioch flow. Anand Ben David, man. What's it got to do with Northwest Africa, man? <laughs> nah, man, I'm just talking any uh, Wow. Oh, we still got a dismount in this one, too. Okay, okay, let's go quick. Double dismount coming in hot. Coming in hot. Just keep this in mind as we talk southern regions where the world ends. Antarctica, Tarzanta. Also, there is towards the south in that region a certain place of ours at which the world ends, which is called the Cavern of Dragons. It is long and wide, excessively difficult, and most severe in severity and difficult with the deepness and depth that is most deep and most cavernly and full of secret places. Indeed, in this place, there are infinite thousands of terrible dragons. <laughs> dragons in the land of the Preston? Dragons on the Voynich Manuscript? Even though they took all these dragons off today, we'll each know that originally on the Voynich Manuscript, it is said <laughs> that uh, it had illustrations including plants, fauna, and dragons. But now we surfed the wave and we didn't find no dragons. I mean, we must not be getting the original OG 12th century because they want us to believe it was dated in the 15th century. Then where's the dragons? Nah. Raja Hiraja Chola II Jadaran, the first Preston John, the emperor of the three Indies, so-called Voynich Manuscript, is a 15th century copy of the original, which was written by him in the 12th century. That be the dragons. <laughs> That's where the dragons be in that Hebreo-Georgian Indian language of the royal house of Israel. That'd be the dragons. We got a whole cavern of dragons, infinite thousands of dragons, which the residents of those surrounding provinces guard with the greatest diligence, lest any wizards from India or elsewhere are able to steal one of those dragons. <sighs> and what do they do when they steal the dragons? What do they do? When the Moor uses enchantment and incantations and magic to steal the dragons. Press the John and the Gypsies, man. You all remember that? One hundred. Oh, man, I got some drop over here, man. Let's get it quickly. It says, uh, 
their expectations no doubt had some specific relationship between scripture for example matthew 2 and the Bible describes the arrival of wise men from the east bearing rich gifts. Here's this match high flow again, right? There is an interesting paragraph written in the 13th century. This is called Preston John and the Gypsies. All right. You can get it in the drop library at 432 thedropcom So here come the match high flow. There, there's an interesting paragraph written in the 13th century back to the 1200s. <laughs> by the English philosopher scholar Roger Bacon about some exotic strangers in Western Europe called Ethiopians. Body bag. Why the exotic? I mean, what, why you got Ethiopians in Spain again? Oh, it's a more on more war. Black burnt face. Ethiopes, Ethiopes, black people in Europe, right? <laughs> in Western Europe, let's go. Now here's, we talked about the necromancy, Simon the Kramakan, the Mad Arab. Here's how they are also tapping into the dragon other than trying to summon it that way. They're also eating it, my naga. They are eating the dragon. Free Phineas, man. The reptile that the Ethiopians in Western Europe, the, the reptile that the Moors are eating, the reptile that the Moorish science temples are eating, is the dragon for it is well known that wise ethiopians moors have come to italy and spain and france and england and those countries of the christians where there are good flying dragons and that by occult arts necromancy which they possess necromicon they drive the dragons out of their caves and they have an art of preparing their flesh and they partake of it against accidents of old age and prolong their lives and make their intellects settle beyond all estimation. They get smarter, they get wiser, they get younger against accidents of old age. Fountain of youth is the drag. They're tapping into it with incantations. It is not necessary to speculate here that these so-called Ethiopians were in fact gypsies. Nah, Egypt, Egypt, Egyptsies. But only to comment on the surprisingly amical attitude of the Western European towards Egypt. Well, you know, with permissions of the Pharaoh. Only with permissions of the Pharaoh do they migrate. So they would be very friendly. They would be very amical, amicable <laughs> towards Egypt or gypsies in the 13th century. Man. The prevailing attitude seems to be one of awe and respect. And we know that this is generally how the gypsies were perceived and treated on their first verified arrival into western europe when egypt came they were treated good in the late 14th century to explain part of the reason why egypt gypsies egypsies were well regarded as well as treated on their first arrival we can now turn to a discussion of prester john and his legend so they have to talk prester to explain how these guys are tribing up against Israel, how these Egyptians are tribing up with these Moors, Ethiopians, and Western Europe, whose reptile is the dragon, who with their occult sciences and more sciences possess, you know, they, they drive the dragons out their caves, out their homes. They have an art of preparing their flesh and they partake of it against accidents of old age man prolonging their lives and their intellects they are partaking of the dragon
Allahu Akbar. And it will happen after he has brought down everything. Second Baruch 73. It will happen after he has brought down everything which is in the world and has sat down in eternal shalom on the throne of the kingdom. And then joy will be revealed and rest will appear. And then health will descend and do like healing do. And illness will vanish and fear and tribulation and lamentation will pass away from among men and joy will encompass the earth and nobody will again die untimely because death is not natural. Nor will any adversary or adversity take place suddenly. Unjust judgment, condemnations, contentions, rav revenges, blood, passion, zeal, hate, all such things will go into condemnation since they will be uprooted. For these are the things that have filled this earth with evils and because of them, life of men came in yet greater confusion. And the wild beasts will come from the woods and serve men. Huh? At the end days, all the animals fight with you, including the dragons, not against you, with you, my naga. The Indian of India Superior that got the dragons at the weddings. Remember, you got dragons at the weddings. The Moors want to eat your dragons to get more life, but your dragons are tied into your family. And these wild beasts are going to come out the woods and start serving the Naga. And the asps and the dragons will come out of their holes to subject themselves to a child. But they trying to pull the dragons out the holes with their incantations to eat the dragon with magic signs. You don't have to do that. The dragon's going to come to you out of their holes to subject themselves to the children of Israel. And women will no longer have pain when they bear. Ain't that beautiful, Aqua? Nor will they be tormented when they yield the fruits of their womb. No more torment. No more death. And our dragons are back. Hey, we back, man. infinite thousands of dragons which the residents of those surrounding provinces guard with the greatest diligence lest any wizards uh, Ethiopians in Western Europe from India or elsewhere are able to steal one of those dragons and you know they're going to eat it now right against accidents of old age for in fact the princes the Khans of the Indians are accustomed to having dragons at their weddings and at other banquets of theirs. <laughs> the dragons are tied in to the tribe tribe. We tribed up. They coming out they holes. They popping up out of Tarzant. And without dragons, they do not consider the banquet to be complete. And just as cattle and mule herders are accustomed to humble and humanizing the horses young to teach them, tame them, call them by their own names, place saddles on their back, ride them wherever they want. <laughs> so too, these men have custody and command of their dragons. They're the dragon commanders, my naga. The dragons are humble in the same way by their incantations and magic, which ain't no black magic. You ain't eating no dragons. You ain't putting no spell of confusion on no dragons. They're just talking about your energy, frequency, and vibration that the dragon is responding to. That's the code we keep. The nine code. Humanize them, teach them, subdue them, call them by their own names, place brittle and saddle on them, and ride them, and ride them, and ride them whenever and wherever they wish. Every year, these dragon peoples release to our magnificence for tribute 100 men, 
100 Dragon Masters. Because they need the Dragon Masters. They need the Dragon Riders. That's what they do. <laughs> and 100 Dragons humanized in this way, which are like cows amongst these men. That's how docile they are towards their masters. Not to the hijack. <laughs> to the masters. To the naga. That's why they so mad and that's why they're so afraid of us popping off because they don't know what power is going to come but they do know <laughs> that it has something to do with these dragons second baruch said the dragons are coming out they holes to subject themselves to a child my naga and the dragons have been at the weddings according to preston john legend and sources been at the banquets been kicking it at a naga's house <laughs> And when the men play with them admirably by leading them here and there, by head and tail, the dragons are like dogs. They're not dogs, but they act friendly like dogs, you dig, when they're trained. Truly, these men with their dragons are our couriers when it pleases our clemency, desiring to know all the news from every part. So that's how they get all the news from all the part of the of the earth plane, all across the barriers. Who's the Lord of the Rings? We send them with these dragons flying through the air, through every climate of the world. Every climate, boss. Our dragons are returning. I mean, wow, right? Wow. <clears throat> Shalak, you know, we've been popping off nice and smooth, nice and easy for the tribe. Tarzanta is holy land. And you can't talk to Preston without bringing it on in and connecting with, with Israel, with the holy land. You don't come from Africa. <laughs> You're connected with much more land, my naga. Are you seeing clearly? This cavern of dragons. This cavern of dragons that are at the weddings. <laughs> this cavern of dragons. Excessively difficult and most severe and severity and difficult with a deepness and depth that is most deep, most cavernly. Full of secret places, infinite dragons. They're talking about a place in the south or in Australia, right? <laughs> They're talking about a Tarzan. They're talking about Antarctica, my name. Remember, Antarctica is just a pristine, preserved, uh, natural uh, rainforest, whatever you want to call it. It's paradise. Under that ice, it's paradise because there ain't no cap on an Articus chest bone. They're saying this is the place that the world ends. That's where the cavern of dragons is at, at the place where the world ends. Oh, where, oh, where <laughs> are the dragons? And who, oh, who is Prestiger? I've been keeping my fire burning with you, my knock. Connecting our Shambhala flow. We got more to talk about with this. Uh, Ofer, Mount Roraima. We got so much to dig on when it comes to the press to get back in the Georgian dynasty, Bragg and Tony dynasties, in the Russian, Russian history, the Mongol history flow, the Shishia, the Almec flow. Definitely got to still crack this Voynich flow. <laughs> You know, talk some more indigenous truth. Talk about that Louisiana purchase and, you know, really start connecting this car on Kahawa flow. Got to talk Kalelu's, Cibola. We're just getting started. And the Mormon flow, that Maroni flow, you already know. <laughs> we got a lot to dig on, man, so... We got some Owaspi, some China, some Lake Capilla, Kapala drop. I mean, 
And I'm just digging on it with you. The history of Septimania, seven cities of gold. Let's let's start talking cities of gold in this piece. We definitely got to talk Ofer, Sheba, and Havili. Shambhala is Sheba. The daughter of Sheba is the daughter of the seven cities. So we'll talk about the islands of Shambhala, the Kalakakra. Land of white waters, the light bearers. Oh, they got an Apollo in Tibet. Yeah, that makes sense. Back to the sun god worship. Back to the Christians, Krishnas. You did. And of course, you got Preston John's kingdom, man, connected with this Shambhala huh? for the dismount. Double, triple dismount. The Dalai Lama connects to Preston John. As we got before as well, our Preston John legend and sources. And in Preston Kingdom, <laughs> it's all happening. That distant country was full of marvels. Phantom emperor ruled in his kingdom with a scepter of pure emeralds. We got an emerald staff. Before his palace stood a magic mirror in which the king was able to observe everything that was happening. Presta is a magical investigation. This is why it's the most important investigation. After you you know, code up, of course, after you, you know, first you got to investigate Hawaii. You got to meditate on the law, right? Meditate on the code. That's the most important investigation. Then you tap into the water. And now you got a mythical kingdom with emerald scepters and magical mirrors and flying dragons. Yeah, flying dragons. What do he say? Flying dragons, infinite dragons, right? Caverns of dragons. They're trying to eat our dragons, man. <laughs> Presta had the scepter of pure emeralds because the scepter never departs from Judah, King David. Before his palace stood a magical mirror in which the king was able to observe everything that, ha that was happening, not only in the provinces of his kingdom, but also in the neighboring countries. Flying dragons carried men swiftly through the air. I said, Flying dragons. So you got Preston John Legend and sources talking about the dragons and Preston's kingdom. You got Preston John Legend or uh, Preston John and the Gypsies talking about them jacking the dragon, jacking the dragons out of Preston's kingdom. You got the Shambhala flow talking about the dragons and Preston's kingdom. You got the second Baruch chapter 73 saying dragons are going to come out their holes and subject themselves to the children. With your awakening comes the awakening of the dragons that were put to sleep. The volcanoes are popping off. And they subject themselves in order to you. Because now you're back in order, right? Flying dragons carry Nagas swiftly in the air for long distances. A truth drug purified a person taking it and compelled him to disclose his true identity. This was the reason why impure souls did not dare take possession of anyone in the kingdom, which thus required no other psychotherapy. Did not take possession of anyone in the kingdom. Impure spirits can't take possession of anyone in the kingdom of Preston John because they're in code. Probably the greatest attraction of the land was the fountain of eternal youth when worthy men and women desired to be rejuvenated and men sauce. <laughs> Yo, seven like goat. All they had to do was fast and then take three draughts or drinks from the fountain. Immediately, sickness and old age departed and they appeared to be 30 years old or 32. 
It is claimed that Preston John himself prolonged his life to a patriarchal age of 562 years. And that's more confirmation that we got. Uh, did a black man discover the fountain of youth, man? OG articles, like I said, we just <laughs> having a good time with a belly flop. They're looking for this fountain of perpetual youth within the new world. But only for the last 500 years. Five hundred years ago is fifteen hundreds. That means that after the fifteen hundreds, they zeroed in on the kingdom of Preston John and they started looking in the new world in the last five hundred years for the fountain of youth. Five hundred and sixty-two years old and going strong, they said about the Preston. Now, which Ethiopia are they looking at as the question? You know, it said they took six baths in this fountain <laughs> of perpetual youth. And love to the Aqua Tracy Lab, man. Uh, press the pack two is going all the way up. Uh, you know what I mean? And it got so many links that Aqua Tracy pdf and included and you know these are just a few that i've been digging off for the last few presses but i've been doing all this with a few <laughs> of the links of aqua tracy let ai to my aqua and my ox ai to you they got ego stones were able not only to improve one's power of vision but could also render a man invisible if worn on the ring now is this the same invisibility ring that we read in uh, Benjamin of Tadula, where David went invisible when the Persian king was looking for him and he popped back up and started walking on water. Magical stones can heat or freeze anything and illuminate the countryside for eight kilometers or five miles. Five miles of illumination from a stone or else plunge the environments into complete darkness. The entrance to a shrine containing a magic stone was guarded by two aged men who admitted only virtuous people. A huge 13-story tower rose in the city of Prestichon. There were no poor in Prestich's kingdom. Justice prevailed in this realm, nor did crime and vice exist there. The reports about a mighty monarch of Asia, presumably a Nestorian, created a sensation in Europe. I mean, this is sensational to them. <laughs> you are sensational to them. This sensation led to them looking for you. <laughs> this was the difficult time of the Crusades when an ally in the East would have been very welcome, hence the interest of the state and church and the priest king of the Indies. Preston John, priest king. Although the tale of Preston John is not devoid of an element of fiction, well, it sounds too good to be true, right? The reality of the persons engaged in correspondence, kings and popes, and the elusive Preston John can hardly be doubted. Surprisingly, the kingdom of Preston John had much in common with the kingdom of what they call higher cost, H-I-A-R-C-H-A-S, uh, -A -A when Philostratus described 1,000 years earlier the geographical, geographical characteristics of both countries pointed to Tibet, back to India Superior. The sages of the two kingdoms were able to control visibility, produce artificial light, and also fly in the air. A paragraph in the best known letter of Preston John speaks of a sandy sea in his kingdom, which could be the Gobi Desert. If so, I fully endorse the conclusions of the American scholar Manny P. Hall. For the dismount, <laughs> the original location given for the empire 
of Prester John was the area of the Gobi Desert where he lived in an enchanted palace in the mountains. If you ask Eastern initiates to describe the Northern paradise called Dejong or Shambhala, the mysterious cities of the adepts, they will tell you that it is the heart of the Gobi Desert in the old sand of Shamo. The ancient mother stands the temple of the invisible government of the world. And even in that Marco Polo series on Netflix, they were crossing this desert, right? And ran into the Prester. And season three would have been all about the Prester, man. So they had to cut it. <laughs> they said, stop. <laughs> no more, man. No mas. In studying 12th century history, when Preston John's fame spread, interesting coincidences can be established. The Order of the Temple was founded in 1118. 1184, the troubadour and knight Templar Wolfram van Etchenbach wrote his tutorial, Romances, in which he summarized all the Holy Grail legends. He hinted at the link of the Holy Grail with Asia, Asia Major, and described it as a stone. Hmm. Was he speaking of Shambhala and the Shintimani stone? The Meisinger's Etchenbach claimed that Totoro had lived for 500 years. This is a strange parallel with Preston John's life, which lasted 562 years. And that source they're getting this from didn't say he died after 562 years it just said that he was 562 years old and going strong right i know this link got all bugged up they got all kinds of ads all over the place now man but let's just get that one piece man at the very bottom right i'm talking about the founder of you Whoever drinks of his water three times without having eaten will have no illness for 30 years. And when he has drunk of it, he will feel as if he had eaten the finest meat and spices, for it is full of Hawa's grace. A person who bathes in his fountain, whether he be of a hundred or a thousand years old, will regain the age of 32. Know that we were born in Baruch, in the womb of our mother. 562 years ago and since then we have bathed in the fountain six times man in other words <laughs> he didn't say he died at 562 he was just getting started at 562 Preston john was letting readers know by the miracle of hawa through the fountain of youth he was 562 years old and going strong and going strong. <laughs> that don't sound like he was croaking, right? This is a strong parallel with Preston John's life, which lasted 562 years. Nah, 562 and going strong, my nugget. We're talking about hey, a forever immortal king. They even say it here. Europe's Difficulty in making contact with Preston John was of no moment, Silverberg argues, for he was immortal and could wait a while longer to be discovered by these hijacks. They got a monument to it, right? Portuguese monument. Preston John. I think they put this one in South Africa. In memory of those seafarers who searched for Preston John from 1145 to 1645, Managa, that's 500 years. And going strong. We're talking Shambhala, Shintamani Stone. Totoro had lived for 500 years. Strange parallel with Preston John, 562. They searching for Preston John for 500 years. 1145 to 1645, my nigga. 
what man do you search for for 500 years? Unless <laughs> he got that water. Unless the Presta got that water. We got that water. The Presta got that water. Oh man, watch out, man. Actually, Etchenbach even connected the legend of the Holy Grail with the tale of Prester John. Prester John is the Holy Grail. That's the secret. <laughs> is the dragon. That's the secret. And apparently they say that uh, this image here is supposed to be that of the press. I can't get it no bigger. Let's see. Wow. And some uh, crusader or Yeah. A mythical king priest, Preston John. It was the quest of the Portuguese explorers, not just to find a sea route around Africa, but to also make contact with Preston John as an ally. Right, right. Connected him with three magi, the wise men, just like Daniel, just like Killian, Belthazar, huh? Three magi. Preston John. An story, an old king renowned for wisdom. On the other side of the right is the cross of Preston John. The monument has no significant link to Port Elizabeth other than the fact that it was a stopping route to the east for Portuguese explorers who, in addition to looking for a way around Africa, was trying to make contact with the Preston. And one of these photos clicked, said that, uh, yeah, these two people, one was Preston, and one was, you know, some jabroni that was uh, <laughs> trying to meet him, you know, trying to meet the Preston. They just trying to meet the Preston. Oh, who, oh, who is Preston, John? Watch out. Holding the towel. Hey, we did it again, my naga. We done surfed the wave through 100 full installments of the Preston John investigation. You can click the links below. You can get the full playlist. You know what I'm saying? You can surf the wave, get your Preston packs, where we put all these videos on the flash drive for you with all the links and all the books. And uh, if you order, George, be patient with us. And that, now that I'm past this checkpoint i can just you know get that one taken care of and make sure all my knockers get all this drop and the water you know what i mean just for your constant water your constant support your constant contribution this is a party that you know we are having right now that we got to experience man and we got to turn up with and seek the real one man <laughs> Who's President John, man? Is he the Mad John, the Dalai Lama? <laughs> Yo, Seth, we out of here, man. Who are the Kara, Kawa, the Shikamagwa?
who was the Korm side. These are Prestes, Joshua, Elijah, Ezekiel, Cons. And they searching until they finally got to India Superior. And then back to that British Museum uh, map, you know what I'm saying, with Presta right over here, right? In 1530, this is 1548. Remember, only in the last 500 years did they start searching for the founding of youth in America. Before that, they were everywhere else. While most of us associate the perpetual fountain of youth with the new world, who's that? I mean, not everybody talks about the fountain of youth connecting with the new world of America, especially Florida. That has only been the case for the last 500 years, man. But does North America actually exist? Or did they find Presta in the old world, in Asia, in Cathay? Who, oh who, <laughs> is Presta John? Hey, tribe up to all my Nagas that are tribing up. We're looking for our Tao. We're looking for our hour checkpoint our redemption the water for surfing the wave and press the john one hunt all stay up suit up choose up